Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 299, which is an incredible number, right, Kristen? Aren't you excited? Yes, You're very, very excited. Very I'm close to 300, see. very close to 300. Next next week will be a 300th episode, but I do not want to dismiss this 299th episode with Lou Pecora, who is a fantastic person and a repeat guest. He was actually one of the very early people I had on, probably in the first... 16 episodes or something like that. Yeah. It was really, really, really uh, been a long time since he's uh, he's been on. Uh, and he's done some amazing work and a really great person. He's a visual effects supervisor, overall visual effects supervisor. He also works for Zoic technically, but uh, does incredible stuff out there. Uh, but yeah, he's really great. I mean, don't you think so, Kristen? Yeah, it was. And it's like about a two-hour podcast and I just... I never got bored. I loved it. Um, he like called himself like a compositing witch doctor, and um, I thought he had like just a myriad. It's my favorite word of knowledge over just everything. You guys talked from like lighting to set stories to his COVID set stories, which makes for a more uh, efficient production. It seems like, right. um, and then just how much he, how much pride he has in his job. Like it's not a job to him. Like he loves what he does. So that was awesome to hear. Yeah, yeah, he's he is he is really, really great person, and I just absolutely love having him on. We have a ton and ton of stories. Like you said, I could uh, it was almost a two-hour episode, but I could actually talk to him for hours. Uh, so much so that at the end of this podcast, I already talked about having him on my other podcast because uh, yeah. that's what's you know kind of stuff that we we do. But yeah, he's a, he's a really great person, and actually hearing his stories of what it's like to try to be on set right now during COVID was kind of interesting and how they planned out yeah. and what what that means because you know people are trying to get back to work and trying to do that stuff and they have to figure out solutions and he's just sort of telling me well this is what it's like and these are the responsibilities we have as people uh to one to continue working and two make it safe for everyone so uh really mm -hmm. great to, to see that stuff uh we only have a, a couple of announcements Kristen. what are what are they um, so you can find these out at chaosgroup.com slash events. And this is our illumination challenge, which we have been talking about. And the deadline is coming up. It's going to be November 30th. And you have a chance to win V-Ray and Corona licenses, cloud credits. So if you go there, you can check it out and enter. Perfect. All right. And that's when you say November 30th, right? So that's coming up mm -hmm. in a little bit, right? So yeah, so yeah uh, go ahead and enter again. All of these are at chaosgroup.com slash events to find those out. We, of course, have tons of product announcements. Lots of things are out with V-Ray 5 things as well as certain things are in beta. I think SketchUp is, uh, V-Ray 5 for SketchUp is still in, mm -hmm. uh, in beta. But check those all out at chaosgroup.com to find out all about that. Lots and lots of new great features uh, in, our, uh, in our products, uh, including V-Ray for SketchUp. Uh, has some very interesting things with V-Ray Vision, and you guys should really understand what that means <laughs> and check it out. We would love your feedback. It's an important thing. Obviously, betas are important for, for feedback, so please let us know. But if people want to find out more about this podcast, where can they go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash cggaragepodcast or chaosgroup.com slash cggarage. Perfect. And if you guys have ideas of podcasts or guests you'd like to have on or just want to give us some feedback, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, labs at chaosgroup.com is our email. And of course, you guys know that these are video podcasts as well now. So we're starting to do videos and we've been doing videos for quite a while now. Actually. So you can see those videos on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast. Or you can just go to our YouTube page for Chaos Group, which is Chaos Group TV. And all of our podcasts are in video form. will be posted up on that, t on, that uh, on that channel on YouTube. All right. That being said, please enjoy this awesome podcast with Mr. Lou Pecora. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. How you been, buddy? I've been good. I've been busy. I've been very lucky that I've stayed busy through all this madness. Um, so it's been, I mean, it's been a while since we've caught up. So ever since uh, leaving DD, just about yeah. three years ago, right around now, I've been at Zoic and 
pretty much from three months after I got there, I ended up becoming a, sort of a loan out to um, Noah Hawley. So I've been working okay. with Noah, did two seasons of Legion, his movie, nice. his directorial premiere, and my first time as a department head for a feature, yeah. and uh, just finished up or finishing up Fargo season four. So in three years, I've done three full seasons of TV and a movie. It's been pretty busy, so I've been pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome though three of that's, those four things were all shot in la too i mean imagine when when do you ever get that three la shows in a row like oh my god like, wow ridiculous yeah yeah but you're still technically at zoic then yeah i'm mean, technically at zoic but they they loaned me out to be production side on these things and i work with you know bring some work to zoic and then have other vendors in the mix as well you know okay. just to keep it spicy and to help you know because sometimes things come in hard and fast you have a 200 shot episode and a 400 shot episode. And then they're both on top of each other. So spreading the work out a little bit helps, you know, so right. I have a lot of freedom to do that. Right. Which has been great. Make sure that but, I can get, I mean, you know, the but best I mean, deal I mean, for. I, yeah. I mean, I've known you, I've known you for a long time, uh, obviously, but, uh, and, and, and you've done some absolutely amazing work and you've, you've always been an absolute pleasure to work with, which is I'll something I think is. I'm a blush here. Uh, <laughs> which is uh something i think people know but because some people may not have heard that episode from what was it three four years ago four years you know this podcast is almost that, six years old it was the 13th <laughs> episode so however long ago that was was it yeah the it was 13th? like the 13th episode yeah, okay let's give people a little re let's give people a little recap what are, what are what is your origin story What's what, what, where did it all, where did it all start for you? <laughs> uh, I grew up in Fresno and to be honest, it all started when I saw the haunted mansion when I was a little kid. Really? At Disneyland. Cause I, yeah. Cause I was just like, I know this isn't real, but how in the hell do they do it? You know, I, I had a little run, you know, from like 75 to 78 where I had saw a bunch of Sinbad movies. I went to the haunted mansion in Pirates of the Caribbean and Disneyland. And I saw star Wars in the theater twice all within like a three year period. And yeah. the whole time for me was like, all right, Star Wars is great. It's, it's, you know, as a little kid, it was amazing, but mm -hmm. I was always more interested in like, how the hell did they do that? You know? So all those behind the scenes with Dykstra and the models and yeah, yeah, yeah. that always interested me far more than the actual movie itself. I, I kind of, I'm not satisfied to just know that something works or to see the end result of it. It's like, okay, that's cool. How'd you guys do that? I, I just have to know how things work. I've always been like that. I can't just take it at face value, you know? Uh, uh, no, that's how you are core. with your cars. I remember with your cars, like, how does it work? <laughs> how does it work? Yeah, I'm not just going to, like, get an engine rebuild. I need to know what parts do what and why. And, yeah, yep. exactly. I got rid of that car, by the way. Really? But, um, driving <laughs> driving a, Volt, a Volt now. Talk about, like, going 180 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you yeah, had the fire just, chicken uh, on that car and everything. <laughs> fire chicken, that's right. I, I love that thing, but it just got to the point where like I just can't, you know, I got I have too much work to do to to like and, you know, to try to say a little Hail Mary to before you turn the key every morning is not the way you want to spend your uh, your time, you know. I got to be on set at 5 in the morning. You're like I, I don't have time for you know, reverting to Catholicism in order to get a car to start, you know, like I'm just <laughs> I reverting to Catholicism. Yeah, I know. I can't yeah, make I this have a, work. I have well, an electric car too, so it's good. <laughs> well, the hybrid's great. So that in case I need to drive across country in a diaper and kidnap somebody like the astronaut, you know, I can, I can yeah. do that uh, in the yep. vault because I can keep gassing up, but it's a good bridge. It's a good gateway, whatever mid, mid, middle of the road thing until we get this whole electric thing really worked out. But Anyway, th those things really kind of shaped my my mind as far as like what I what I and I never thought it was a job that would be possible. I always thought it must be rich people doing these things because who would pay somebody to do this stuff? So it wasn't until like the early 90s and Jurassic Park came out and I realized, you know, this is actually a job that people do. And I'm I'm working at a design company, you know, in Fresno doing graphic design and illustrator and Photoshop 2.0 kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. I could if I could, I could do this, you know, I could learn this stuff. So I started learning stuff and I, I moved out. I took a night job at a restaurant, which was so much fun, saved up a bunch of money, moved down to LA and managed to get myself a job at digital magic, which at the time was doing, you know, star Trek Voyager and star Trek, uh, yeah. deep space nine and, and a bunch of other random stuff. And I was doing like tape, the equivalent of tape room type situation. Yep. And I just wanted to get into doing the work. And then this, this Cinderella Whitney Houston movie came in. 
and they didn't have anyone to do the morphs on that. So they brought a guy in named Joe Mandia who used to do the morphs. Um, and he taught me, they basically paid him to teach me and I learned very quickly and then he was gone and I just did all the morphs on Cinderella. And then we got this other show in that no one wanted to touch with a 10 foot pole based on the name and no one knew what it would end up becoming, you know, one day. Uh, but I knew it had work and people were trying to get off of not wanting to do it and I was dying to do it. So I jumped in and started doing all the morphs for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh-huh. And I did basically all, just about all the seasons of Buffy and three of the seasons of Angel, two or three, I can't even remember. And now, the fact, more for using money, like elastic. Uh, uh, elastic, elastic reality, that's reality. right. Yeah. At, at, yeah, at Digital Magic at night, I had my day job at DD because then I ended yeah. up having to leave Digital Magic in order to make the jump to artist. And, um, and I did my nights at, at Digital Magic on Buffy and Angel. And in fact, the, I always called that Trans Am that we were just talking about, the car that Buffy built. Because all the money I made <laughs> from my freelance gig at night was <laughs> ended up I sunk into that damn car. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was a car that Buffy built. But it, um, you know, it also trained me up and, and gave me a lot of like insight into how things worked. And I learned some basic comping. And then I was off to then once I got to, at, at DD, I kind of took off. Three months after I got there, I was comping shots on Supernova for uh, Car- Carrie Villegas, Brian Grill, and Mark Stetson. Yeah. And boy, oh boy, ever since then, it's like, I, I have never really stopped. You know, I had a moment at SIGGRAPH with Victoria Alonzo, right? That's like the godmother yeah. of visual effects. And we did a panel together for Spider-Man Homecoming. And she uh, she pulled me aside and she's like, all right, so you left Dee Dee. What are you going to do? What do you want? And I was like, you know, I don't know. I, I like, I've been going for 19 years straight. And I have not had time to stop and recalibrate what it is that I want to do. I'm just keeping getting thrown from hotter fire to hotter fire to hotter fire. Yeah. And and I just haven't had a chance to stop and recalibrate that. And she, I just love, I love the raw honesty you get from Victoria. She's like, no, 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 no. Sweetie, when you get a minute with a person like me and they ask you what you want, you don't tell them you don't know. You have an answer and you tell them and they can help you get it. So let's get that answer. And then you call me and I was just like, <laughs> I felt like I was three years old and I was so grateful for that, that, le- <laughs> that lesson. Cause she's right. I mean, she's right. When do you get five minutes with her? You know, but basically like, she, I, if a more, a more honest thing, she would have been like, call me when you want an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, she's, you know, Hey, yeah. she's who she is for a reason. Yep. That woman's intense as hell and she yeah. drives herself very hard. So how can you not expect people around you to drive yourself just as hard? You know? I mean, she like, comes from TV commercials, doesn't she? And that's, yeah. 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 And then I think she was at RNH for a little while, but she's, mm-hmm. well, she's one of those people that like, you know, you could, you could drop her in a, in a, in the middle of some like war zone in another country with nothing but, you know, a bottle of water and she's going to end up running the country before a month. You know, she's just yeah. one of those people that, it happened to be visual effects, but if it was anything else, it would have been the same right. result. You know, there's people like that. I always, you know, there's a sparkle that a person either has or, or doesn't have. And, you know, like you right. could take everything away from her and she'd still, in a year, she'd be back and with something right. else. You know, that's, that's just, that's just the way some people are, you know, um, and they tend to stick, they tend to kind of, she's got a lot of them over at Marvel now, you know, <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's pretty great. And it makes sense because you recognize that in other people. And you just, you know, you know, when you see it, um, but anyway, um, so yeah, that's sort of my background. And then I, I've, uh, I've been on this, on this train lately of just, uh, overlapping projects and working on really fun stuff with some, I mean, Legion was one of some of the most fun I ever had, but they just, these challenges, you read a script and you're like, all right, so a guy throws a straight jacket off and it turns into a guy. Okay. <laughs> it's going to slide across the floor and turn into a man. All right. Um, Oh, and they did and they they hate CG. So, how are we going to do this? All right, uh, right. those kind of things, you know. <laughs> uh, and that's like that's so much that's so refreshing and so much fun because it's. I mean, I've on it. I can. I mean, am I allowed to use like G rated swear words? Swear words. You can use all the language you want. Look, Tim Miller mm-hmm. has been on three times, and trust me, <laughs> you can use whatever <laughs> language you want. Tim, rock on. God, I haven't talked to him. He probably wouldn't even remember me, but I met him once. I was really impressed. Him and and, and Kat, I think, was at Blur at the time. Anyway, um, 
I always equate the job of a visual effects supervisor as basically like it's it's like trying to solve a Rubik's cube with a shotgun shoved up your ass. <laughs> yep. You just are like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of, <laughs> and yeah. and when you're doing that in the facility, it's more like you know maybe a BB gun pointed at your chest. Right. But when you're on set, it's a shotgun up the ass. Cause yeah, every- because you have to, you have 10 seconds to think of a st- something that's going to affect the next several months of your, of your life. You're going to get a bunch of Monday morning quarterbacks in at the facilities with their feet up on the table and a, and a, you know, a coffee going, oh, why'd you shoot it like this? And you're just like, my God, man, you have no idea what it took to get you that much. So, right. you know, I'm just like, it, it teaches you to understand people who lack perspective sometimes and yep. grow patience, which is something I've always struggled with anyway, having patience, but um, yeah. I've learned, I've learned to have them, but it, it's, it's, it's a real charge too though. And it's super fun. Cause at the end of the day, if I don't get that Rubik's cube, right. It, there, no one's going to die. You know, if I right. screw something up on set or if I think later, Oh, I should have shot it this way. No one's going to die. No, it right, right, right. just makes it, it's a different solution to the problem. And honestly, I would say probably 60% of the time, by the time you get in the editing room, what you're going to do to a shot is different than the intent was that when you shot it anyway. Right. You know, like I was all hell bent on getting these HDRs recently for something. There was these CG shotgun shells in this really dark, very specifically lit environment. And I made, I stopped everyone down and made them let me get those HDRs. And we're looking at the cut just a couple of days ago. And it's like, we don't need those things. There's already plenty of slow motion CG shell, uh, sl- uh, slow motion practical shells. We don't need CG ones. And I'm like, right. Got a bunch of HDRs that we don't need. You know, right. it costs 10 minutes or whatever on set because it was super low light. But, you know, the people working on those shots are, are never going to know that they have HDRs that they don't need. So for every time you're wrong one way, you're also wrong another way. You just, yeah. you're just doing the best you can. And you know, you're making a movie three times. You're doing it once in prep, once when you're on the day. And then again, once it's edited and you're in post, I mean, you're doing it at least three different times. And one of the hardest parts is trying to purge what you know from each of those stages as you move into the next stage. Mm. Because really one of the things I find I, you know, isolating in some ways, but also really is one of my favorite parts of this job is I'm the only person on the whole thing, whether it's a movie or a TV show, whatever, I'm the only person on that entire production, unless I have people with me, like VFX people with me, but the only department that's with that thing from page to print, like the first script comes out, I'm on the first distro of it, and I'm reading the first, one of the first people reading that script. Right. And I'm the last person with it. Me and usually the editor We're sitting mm-hmm. in the DI suite waiting for that last tweak in the color, make sure it's all perfect, tech changes, you know, and have been there. The editors usually aren't on set or sometimes aren't on set, at least in my most recent experience. And the people that are on set are not in post, you know, the TV directors right. are handing off and then they're done and the showrunner's there. But the showrunner wasn't always on set either because that's why they have directors shooting on the day. Right. So there's nobody else that's really got the full story of a shot. So when I'm watching dailies, I know exactly where I was when we shot that. And when we're working on a shot, I know where everything was, who was there, what happened that day. Oh, there's another take of this where this guy wasn't here. So I know we can find a clean. There's nobody else that gets to have their hands on the whole thing all the way yeah. from the page to the print. And I just love that because once again, being a guy who loves to get under the hood, get his knuckles busted and his hands dirty. I yeah. love that, that I have the full story and that I can be part of changing that story along the way too. You know, once you build up enough credibility and you're not just the annoying guy with the shiny ball, does anyone still use those things anyway? But I'm not, you know, I know someone you're not just the, posted a bunch of pictures of the, of the uh, chrome balls. And I'm like, wow, oh, the Christmas ornaments are back. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just, I'm not going to stop a show down to shoot those things anymore unless they decide they want to do it. You know, like I've got a Theta and I can usually sneak an HDR in between takes when no one even knows I was there. It yes. seems like it's. You know what I just good. saw a paper on uh, uh, that's, I think it's published at SIGGRAPH is it's from Paul DeBevick's group. <laughs> and they are. Professional de- SIGGRAPH paper writer. <laughs> yeah. They, they are deriving, they're deriving an HDR based on a photograph of a face. <laughs> 
Uh, they, if anyone could pull that off, it'd be Paul They have for enough sure. information by looking at how a face is lit to derive a whole mm -hmm. HDR from it. <laughs> All right, Paul, let's see an HDR from this one. Let's yeah. get it. <laughs> Challenge. I was like, on the throne. You just, you know, you just shoot the plate and then you get the HDR from the plate. You just derive it. <laughs> it, it. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, a certain degree of extrapolation I'm sure is there, but that guy is nothing short of brilliant. So I'm yeah. sure he'll, if he says it works, I trust him, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, I, I had a great moment with Paul <laughs> where if, if, if you want to hear, yeah, um, yeah, I worked course. with him. I worked with him on this, this ridiculous thing that I kept was like, I felt like I was on the candid camera. Um, back in the day, it was a, a Paradise Lost feature, and we were we were at right. Light Stage for two weeks of the John Lit. You know, yep, of course. Like two weeks with John Lit is like the best. You know, like you're getting paid to hang out with that guy. It's amazing. So yep. we were we were with Paul at ICT. Uh, did that ever get made? Like, it never got made. That movie, did it? No. No way. No way. <laughs> Alan Funt, man, I was waiting for Alan Funt to pop out any day. And I'm like, where is Alan Funt? And no one knows Alan Funt anymore. I got to say, like, it's Ashton Kutcher or something. I'm just gonna say now. Right. <laughs> uh, I learned that everything I know, I got to unknow and know new things now. It's right. That is not all from my brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just got to keep, keep going. Um, anyway, so you're, anyway, you're at Paul, ICT with Paul I was, and Lit. I was at ICT with Paul. We were talking about the, the, the LEDs in the light stage. And the first thing I thought is how do you get all these LEDs to match? I mean, these LEDs are all going to have a slight amount of variance to them. And you know, yep. there's, there's, that's just like already inherently you're dealing with a certain amount of tolerance, like with resistors or capacitors, you're five, a 10, 15% yep. tolerance. And, he tried to explain it to me in, you know, in, in simple terms, which I, I kind of grokked, but I, I was like, so what, what's the temperature of these bulbs? Now, I, now I'd already spent time with Jonathan Eckstad and at DD, I'd been through a few color pipelines of my own. I helped, uh -huh. helped work aces into DD's first foray on Transformers 2, right. dealing with a bunch of six different film formats and unifying them and Sony's first stab at S log. I mean, I was there for a lot of this color stuff. I can't, I'm yeah. not a genius, but I'm, I'm a, a color witch doctor, you know, and okay. maybe not a color scientist. <laughs> I know a little bit. Sure. So I tell Paul, I'm like, so what's the color temperature of these lights? And without, without missing a beat, he goes, see, that's the kind of question I get from somebody who really doesn't know a whole lot about color. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I'm going to, and lit was just cracking up. Lit was in the background just laughing well, was, with that. I mean, because Paul is usually, he's usually extraordinarily polite. So that, oh, he is. I, I don't think he was being a, a jerk or anything. He just was, <laughs> he's just on a, operating on a level that is like, you know, yeah. a whole different level. And when he explained it to me, I understood what he meant, that the color curve actually has a little bubble in it that sort of is like the phosphor is one thing and the coating of the LED is another. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. there's a color transformation that happens physically. With, I, I understood it, but yeah. I, I wasn't expect. I was expecting like, Roughly 5,500 or right, 3,200 right. or it's adjustable. I was expecting right. something like that. Cause I know that there's a three dimensional aspect to color. I mean, I, it, yeah. but I, I just, I don't, he didn't really know me that well. And he had no reason to think that I knew what I was talking about in the first place. So it, it was, but it was just an interesting, it was a really funny moment. So I was, I always laugh. I always think about that. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I wasn't offended. But I thought it was hilarious. Cause it's like, that's how, that's how badass this dude is. He could, he yeah, could yeah. pull that shit and I can go. All right. You got me. <laughs> I call him, uh, uh, I, I jokingly called him and many times cause I've actually been, uh, on stage with him many times and I've had to introduce him. Uh, but I call him the, the Michael of Jordan of lighting, <laughs> the Michael Jordan of lighting. Michael Jordan of lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. So I got dunked on by the Michael Jordan of lighting. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. I mean, that's sweet. I mean, now people are like, you know, you want to buy this Jersey? I was wearing this when Jordan dunked on me. So yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like that in VFX, I guess. It's uh, yeah. It, it, Paul's great though. He's, he's, he's brilliant. He's he brings really cool. so many wild things to the table that you just never thought. I never would have imagined some of the stuff that I've seen that guy like, think up you know and yeah. that's what's so fun about this business is there's always something else that that the, that, that, you, that is that is required to come up with and that was what was so fun about legion i mean fargo was a lot more straightforward it's a period piece from the 50s and so there's a lot of set you know we shot it in chicago for kansas city and, and there's a lot of set you know uh time period anachronisms that we had to work out and things right. that didn't look that weren't right for the period or, or this or that. And always a bunch of different little things that, that came up. And then there were some very specific, like, no, this is a big visual effects sequence and you're going to be on the hook for a lot of stuff, which if you're watching the show, you'll see it in episode okay. nine, um, four and nine. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's 
pretty straightforward. And I'm, I was I was never really super puzzled about any of it. Like, all right, this is a building extension. This is going to be, you know, this or that. This is a blue screen. Right. This is a blah, blah, blah. Um, but for Legion, it was just like a kaleidoscope of, of, of challenges, which I right. just relished every minute of. I loved it. And I could see where it would scare the hell out of people who are smarter than I am. But because I'm just dumb enough to still love doing this, I was really... I sunk my teeth into that show like I haven't had yeah. it before, and I had a real, real blast. And the team, the, the team that Noah brings together too, like you know, Danny Gonzalez, the DP, um, Polly Morgan, Pete Conchal, Eric Messerschmidt. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of Eric. He just yeah. did, um, uh, dan- uh, not Dances with Wolves. What's that? Raised by Wolves. Oh, Raised by Wolves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's he's done a million things. He's on Mindhunter, and these guys are some of the and girls are some of the best in the, in the world, and. And to get to collaborate with them, you know, Regis Kimball, the editor, these people are just phenomenal. And the directors that they can bring in are just top, top caliber. And it's such a, such a blast to get to absorb these things and to help figure out some of these ridiculous problems. I mean, what other, what other industry are you going to get to do that in, you know, like, right. Well, so you, I mean, uh, when, when, when you and I worked together, I think, I think the first time we worked together was on iRobot, right? Uh, briefly, were you on Peter Pan? I was not on Peter Pan. Then it was iRobot. So iRobot. And then it was my first job as a se- as a sequence lead. And mm-hmm. you were working with me on several sequences. So you and I worked together, mm-hmm. like the, the headquarters sequence and uh, mm-hmm. a couple of other HQ, things. HQ, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Everything uh, but VL, because I was with um, um, Andy Weisler on, on VL, Vicky Level. Right. right. But you and I were on everything else together. Everything else together. And uh, it, I learned so much from you at that point because I'd always been a strict CG guy and I never sort of had a compositing partner. You know what I mean? Mm. And I really was uh-huh. blessed by that because oh, well. I could have been, I could have been with someone who was not as kind as you with me <laughs> and oh, taught me on. so much Bless because you, I did, I did. I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot. I mean, Rienzo would have been really good too, but you Rienzo's have great. a little bit more. Rienzo's amazing, amazing person. But you said you tend to explain things in a way that made a lot more sense to me. And you also were very like, what do you mean you don't know about this? I thought you were a lead. It's like, I, I know lighting really well. I just don't know compositing. I wasn't like that. Was I like that? You were very nice. Yes. I wasn't like, you're, you're a lead. You don't know that. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Someone else could say. Oh, that. I could have been. Someone else would have been like that. Someone else could. Yeah, have been Yeah, there like were that. some lighters on that show that were like that with me about lighting. <laughs> there were some. Yeah, and that's yeah. cool. You know, it's just like like. No. I don't know. You were great too. We we got along great because we're both like more interested in the solution than in the ego, right? More yes. interested in in having fun of getting there. And I guess that's what you're saying is like for me, iRobot was such a special show because. I mean, the movie was okay. You know, I thought the work looked really good. Yeah. Um, but for me, the, the day-to-day of it, that's really what it boils down to for me yeah. with this job. Like, people are like, oh, congratulations on Fargo airing. It's like, great. You know, I'm, I'm super happy that the world gets to see it. But do people like it? It's nice if they like it. Do critics like it? It's nice if they like it. You know, mostly for the other people I, I work with right. and respect, for Noah and for the directors. And mostly yeah. for them, I hope people like it. But for me, I honestly don't care if people like it or not. For right. me, the, I don't get up and go to work just because, like, oh, God, if every, I hope everybody likes this. Like, I don't give a damn. Like, for me, getting up at 3 in the morning and driving two and a half hours to the middle of nowhere to shoot a bunch of stuff with a bunch of crazy people, that is why I do it. For, it's its own reward, you know? Like, right. the process for me is this, the fun. Getting up every day. Um, and I didn't have a whole lot of set experience at that time on iRobot. But getting to come to work and work with you and Diana and, and Lynn yep. and – and uh, Hansi and Eric Nash, the great Eric Nash. I mean, are you yeah. kidding me? Getting to sit in that screening room and to learn from the, th- the way he sees things. And Jonathan, my God, Jonathan Eggstad. I oh, mean, yeah. I felt like I was in school. I mean, Talk I about color like scientist, right? <laughs> it's like- God, man, Jonathan is just brilliant. And he's not, you know, Jonathan just teaches, he's an autodidact. He just teaches himself stuff. You know, he was a yeah. video engineer. He wasn't, he learned programming on his own because he was on overhead for a while and thought new could be better. So he started writing a 3d interface and multiple channel support. Like, right. Holy macro. You don't go to school to learn that you got the sparkle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, yep. uh, and getting to be around people like that and spend my days like that. Like, you know, even if I was a millionaire, I'd still do this because it's just, it's just so much fun. It's like going to summer camp. I mean, when it sucks, it sucks, but it's over very quickly. Right. 
when you're working with people who are more like that ego type stuff and, and I'm learning stuff then too, you know, I'm still learning stuff when I'm being condescended to and when I'm being talked down to when I'm being mistreated, like I'm learning a lot. I'm, you know, sure. And I just got to remember that it's like, uh, you know, it's going to pass. It's like a cold or something. It's going to be done and I'll be fine afterwards and I'll be stronger for it. And that's that. But right. those, the process is, is, is the magic. That is, that is why I, do this job. That's why you put yourself through these insane hours and conditions is because you get to work with people like you. And it's just, that's the fun. That's the whole, that's the reward itself right there. Yeah. But I think one of the things I learned from you on iRobot, uh, in terms of the comp thing is that, you know, the, the, the lighting in the CG was definitely a slow burn solution as opposed to comp where it's like, I need a solution now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Done, well, you know, and I was like, okay. And so I learned that attitude, uh, from you and like how to do that. It's like, okay, how are we going to solve this problem? It's like, I got to get something on the farm in 10 minutes to make sure he gets this out <laughs> now. And I got to figure that out. And, and that was, that was fun. You know, one at first it was it's very fun. scary. It's like, you know, the shotgun up the butt kind of situation, but not mm -hmm. as, not as much as on set for sure. But it was like, I was like, okay, I better, there's no time to experiment. This shot has to get done. Boom. And it, I've got to come up with a solution and it, and it, and it right. works. And I think that was the thing that was kind of an interesting uh, idea. And listen, I also learned from, from you about like, you got to get it perfect. You got to get it perfect. This is a feature film. This is going to, you know, the color is going to be right. It's going to be projected on a big screen and film and your blacks have to match. Your noise has to match. I, you know, I look, it's the first time I ever. You, were, I think you were the one who sat down next to me and showed me how to match blacks and how to how to match my grain. I've never done that before, right? So, that's something that I, I, I was like, that's kind of cool, you know. And here's how you gauntlet a shot, Chris. You know, I was like, okay, now I know how to do that. And so that was a really cool lesson that I learned. Uh, by the way, it's for those who don't know, gauntleting a shot is even after you've actually finaled the shot. <laughs> you still go back and check it to really make sure it deserved to be final. <laughs> and right. sometimes there's, it, yeah, there, yeah, there's, there's a director final or the client final. And they're looking a lot of times at, a, at an avid or they're looking at a film projector. They're looking at something, you know, the days it was film projected, but, um, but then once, you know, you have to get in and you crank up the gamma, you crank down the gain, you, you look at the three channels and you double check every line, every patch of grain, every black level, because, once it gets into DI, which is usually at, you know, two in the morning, the, the night after the print was due and the producers managed to beg another day, you don't want to get that call at three in the morning to go back and fix something. You just don't. So once it's final, you go back and do the final QC on it to make sure that it's going to hold up. Because if it's projected on the back of an airplane or if it's on now on your phone, they look very, it looks very different than it does on film. It's, in some ways, film's more forgiving. And some of these other formats are not. Once it gets compressed down for TV and all that kind of stuff in DVDs, you better have it all together so that you, it can track all the way through the gamma range and the, and the exposure range and make sure that that's holding up because you don't know what's going to happen in DI, especially now. And that's one of my new like banes is the whole mats, give, given DI mats. Like we balance the comp. If I give you mats, it's going to break. Just tell me what you want to do and we'll fix it. And that's one of those things that everyone needs yeah. to come to an equilibrium on, I think. But That'll be for another podcast, but uh, yeah. So that's what gauntleting is. It's just and that was made up. That term was coined by you know Nash, bringing Eric Nash up again. He's the right. one who I first heard. You, I first heard that term kind of come from him. Like we got to run the shot through the gauntlet to make sure that it holds up to all the poking and prodding, as, you, right. as it were. Yeah, yeah. And so that you know that that also you know when you go through that, it 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 makes you feel like you've perfected it. You know, you're like. This is good for delivery and you feel, yeah. you feel extra confident, you know, as opposed to, I guess, I hope it's good. It's final, you know, but, and I was like, yeah. no, I've really double checked this. It feels good. So, yeah, well, there's also the thing, I mean, like, like we're professionals and we take pride in our work and the director finaled it. Okay. The director finaled it. And they're also counting on me to do all this dirty work. Right. Right. That's, I mean. Michael Bay is not going to sit there and step through every frame of a shot and make sure that everything's perfect. He's counting on me to do that. And if right. I don't do that, I've let him down. And if it gets smoked out in company three, and believe me, if it's in there, it will get smoked out at company three. That's on me, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want that. So like it ends up being a battle sometimes with artists because they don't understand that. They don't, a lot of times they don't understand. No one's ever going to see that. You know, don't tell me. I just did. 
don't tell me no one's ever going to see it because I just did. Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, that yeah. is the dumbest comeback ever. That's tell me you have no pride in your work. Yeah. You know? But you don't get that too often. Like a lot of the people have pride in their work and they want to do a good job and, and you feel good about that work. You know, I've only met one person in this whole career that is that looked at this as a job. Like I'm only in it for the money. And I was like, wow, that's and he was really good. I will never name him, but I was like, wow, that's you're really good for someone who looks at it as a paycheck. That's amazing. Like I was yeah. kind of taken aback. There's thousands of people that want your job. <laughs> yeah. And most of them want it because it's, it's for all yeah. the right reasons, you know, I mean, sure money, of course you need a job that pays for sure. But I mean, like I was just impressed to, to have it be put in my face. So, ha, so honestly and directly, you know, it's just right. like paycheck, man. It's like, wow. You do good work for someone who's just getting a paycheck. Like, hey, okay, all right, cool, fair. Now I know. Now I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. You know, it takes all types. So, so I mean, anyway, we 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 did some really great stuff, but uh, uh, you know, you're you're doing a lot of episodic work right now, which a lot of people are doing really great episodic work. Ep the episodic work used to not necessarily be super high profile. It isn't. That's changed a lot now. Mm. Yeah, HBO and AMC, you know, started yeah. it. I think. I think they did. And then now with Netflix and COVID and <laughs> Amazon yeah. Prime. I mean, I'm currently I'm binging uh, The Boys season two, which I just love that show. It's so good. And nice. the work in that show is just stellar too. It's just it's, but it's also just a smart and fun, just diabolical show. It's it's great. Right. But you know, that you're right that it is. And and the thing is that didn't change about episodic though is is the schedules and that's the part that I that took me a while to get used to. I was very interested in episodic because you could spend eighteen months on a feature and you're working with one maybe if the production gets in trouble two directors, right. um, you know a couple of executives and but in TV you're dealing with like in one season of TV I'm dealing with potentially ten directors you know right um, and on set for six months straight. And I had realized that at that point in my career, I didn't have enough exposure to the people really making things, you know, really doing stuff. Mm -hmm. I was locked away in a vendor as a vendor, you know, vendor side guy. So mm -hmm. I wanted exposure to the, to the people that are actually like making these decisions and, and doing the on set work. And mm -hmm. I wanted on set experience. Those are two things right. that I felt I was lacking. And honestly, Victoria's question kind of made me think about that stuff. I was like, well, I don't want to give her the answer. Like, well, I want to do one of your shows because frankly, I didn't feel I, I was ready and I didn't feel I would have done a good job on a Marvel show as, mm. as like even a second, you know, a second suit, because in spite of all my years doing features, I didn't have the onset chops that I needed to keep up with the people that I had seen. Like you, Yannick Sirs, I mean, that guy, that guy is no joke, man. He's on set and he's running the show and everyone's listening to him and he better have a good answer. And he always had a good answer. That guy is that guy is sharp as, as attack and knows what the experience knows what to do and how to do it. Right. And I learned very quickly by working with Yannick that I was not ready for that kind of, that kind of a role on, you know, at the Marvel level of, of the work. And, uh, I, so I was like, all right, I have to fill these gaps before I can answer Victoria's question, uh, in the way that I wanted to that day. Um, so I, I got into episodic thinking I'll get a lot more exposure to on set. I'll get mm -hmm. exposure to more directors, more styles of filmmaking, more styles of work. And that's exactly what I got. I got way more than I bargained for. I, I had myself on a three year plan and in three months I was just immersed in it, you know, and I was suddenly production side soup of the whole, whole thing. Right. And I just rose to it, I guess, cause I, they, brought me along for a few more after that. And so I am still doing it and I've been having the time of my life ever since with it, but getting, getting all of that exposure and getting all of that experience was, was, um, was critical. But what I found about television that, that, that was very different from features is you're prepping one episode, you know, at the very beginning, it's all prep, 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 prep. And then you start shooting. Then you're prepping the next one while you're shooting one. And then by the time you get to episode three or four, you're posting one while you're, prepping six while you're shooting four and all of a sudden it gets like you're just suddenly like it becomes very motion blurred you know like you yep. gotta oh my god and, and like you just finished a 12 to 14 hour shoot day 
and you can't go to bed because you're doing your uploads and then you're looking at shots that they posted for you to review that night and then oh yeah at eight o'clock tomorrow morning i have a prep meeting for something else but i'm supposed to be on set for this and i guess i'm calling into that one you know like how the hell do you do it it's it's right it it's it was rough but um yeah. it's exhilarating but it's 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 rough and that's i think the biggest like premium cable as we call it or premium television is in some cases higher resolution than a yep. film you know it, and people can pause on it very easily and look at a frame you can rewind it and step through it you know more easily than you can a film to some degree yep so in a lot of ways like there's nowhere to hide anymore there but the schedules are still brutal so you're doing feature work on a television schedule it's almost like it has gotten to the point where you know you have to be you have to be there's there's no room for messing around you know you're, you're right. kind of finding those cracks in the day. Oh good. It's a dialogue scene. I can maybe look at some shots on my laptop from the corner of the stage quietly while they're shooting this over here. And they'll call me on the walkie if they need me. So you're hearing other, all these voices in your head all day on a walkie while you're on the phone and your other side here. Yeah, no, the shot looks pretty good. Hold on. No, no, it's not for me. Don't worry. And the guys back <laughs> at the office must be like, this guy is losing his shit and what's going on. Right. And you know, it's hard to understand that until you're in that situation that you're really wearing like three hats at the same time. And it's just like, you're like Peter Brady on two dates. You know, if you right. remember the Brady bunch, like you just, you know, you're not going to have a second date with either one if you're not careful, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's, <Yep. laughs> but it's fun though. It is so fun to have that, um, to have all those plates spinning. It, it really is. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you like it. I mean, I, I remember uh, specifically when I was uh, at Sony and I was in a similar boat where I basically was uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted to go into the, the supervisor area because I thought I was good. And I, it's not that I wanted to be a supervisor. Is it, I liked working with people and sort of bridging all the pieces together. Right. Oh yeah. And that's the part that's cool about it. It's like doing the work is kind of fun, but it's really like, okay, I don't know as much about this, but this person knows how to do it. And that person knows how to do it. I'm going to put it all together and we're going to find a solution. And it's going to go this direction. And here's my vision. How do we get this done? And that's so much fun. fun. And I sort of saw yeah. that, that, that process. And so I actually asked Kevin Mack at the time and, uh, oh, Kevin. and, uh, and Kevin, you know, he was my soup on, on Ghost Rider, And he basically told me, well, if you want to be a supervisor at Sony, you're going to have to wait a long time because you're just going to have to have go behind, you know, all the stuff. He goes, I would just quit, do some commercials. <laughs> so that's basically what I tell you to do. <laughs> that's great advice. Was, commercials is great. Yeah. And I did. And I had a great time. And so I was on set commercials and it was so much fun. And I learned so much because boom, you know. So fast. Three so months, fast. you got to figure it all out. <laughs> Done. Yeah, you learn so much so fast in commercials, even more so than you remember Klaus Hanke, right? Yeah, of course. Klaus is, Klaus is just brilliant. And he got, he told me already that he got as good as he was. I mean, without being arrogant, class has one of those ways of saying, you know, yeah, I'm good without sounding arrogant. I don't understand. Like if I tried that, I'd be like, dude, did you hear yourself? You know, but like class says it and it's like, oh, he's so sweet. Um, yeah, he's just genuine, I guess. But he, he told me that he got as good as he got because he did commercials for a while. And you just, you're facing 10 times more situations yeah. in the same amount of time. And I mean, like I said, you know, what would normally be a two year or like, you know, let's say you're on a feature for 18 months. That's on the long side. But in the time that I would have done two features, I did three seasons of television and a feature, you know, and that's right. like, that's where, that's what I wanted. And that's what I've got, you know, and, and right. it's, I like the pace. I like TV. I think it's a lot of fun. The pace is great. And you, you end up kind of, it's almost like, you know, features that are not, when, when a feature comes in as 911 work, those are fun too, because all of a sudden everybody's paying attention. It's not like this. Well, I'm going to have my sushi and then we're going to decide whether what this guy should be. I think he's okay. Let's, we'll look at it next week and see, try right. some more stuff. Like no one, no one's panicking, but once right. everyone starts panicking, then that's when it's like, you're going to get some decisions. Real, real made. decisions get made. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. yeah you're going to yeah. get people's attention. You're, you're not wasting time anymore. I think a lot of time gets wasted in movies when you're just sitting there at the beginning trying to plan. And if you stuck to that plan, then it would be time well spent. But how many times do you stick to that plan? Like I've been through so many shows where, you 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 pl you plan and prep and you have previs and you try to shoot the previs and then what ends up on screen if you a b that i've done that on just about every show i've been on where i've made the little sneaky version of it where i put a picture in picture of the previs or the plate inside the final scene right. and 
most of the time on features, it's not even half of the shots are, are represented in there. It's a black sp square because it changed so dramatically that what was shot was not even close. So right. you know, the minds get changed in editorial once it starts coming together. And I'm not criticizing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just what that means is that, that people are, 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 are flowing creatively all the way through the end. It's not like right. you're rigidly stuck to what you shot. You, and and there, that's an important part of the process, too, that I think a lot of people find frustrating. I just wish... I wish that it was – I wish there was a little less of that, to be honest, because I just feel like there is a lot of time spent experimenting on stuff that really ends up going nowhere. And it's – I like to spend time and have it on the screen. I like to spend time and have it – have the – I don't want to be robbed of time later to finesse something or to check those black levels or to check the grain or to make sure that the shot isn't all it can be because we – we changed direction at the last minute and now we only have a week to do this. I, I, right. I, it's heartbreaking to me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, all right. But the, obviously as you, as you were hinting before, like, you know, the content for uh, streaming networks is on the rise, shall we say, <laughs> or very at an all time high. Yeah. It's and, ridiculous. And but that's because we're all stuck at home right now. Nonetheless, even before that was going on even before that, uh, people loved content they were doing there was a there's a format they were delivering it in there's a way that the quality is really good uh they're spending some money on getting good writing original content is at an all-time yeah. demand <laughs> you know yeah. yeah yeah um so so uh so that's great in terms of the kind of content you're doing what has it been like for you uh to do that because obviously there's still a demand for great content there's still a lot of great stories and things that want to be done but they're having a hard time shooting and they're having a hard time getting that through the pipe. So how, how are you been dealing with that? Well, it's funny you say that cause I was, you know, we were shooting, um, doing a couple of reshoots before we were going to launch into the final block. Cause the way we did Fargo was it was in two episode blocks. Okay. So we'd have one director for two episodes. So Noah shot the first two and then we had another director shoot the next year, another director, you know, in two episode blocks. And so we right. were about to get going on nine and 10. Mm -hmm. when uh, we snuck in a few reshoots in the middle for stuff, additional photography, not reshoots, mm -hmm. additional photography. I got <laughs> to remember these terms. Um, so Noah was there with us in Chicago and he was directing um, some additional photography for some mm -hmm. earlier episodes because we realized, you know, through the editing process, there were some pieces that he wanted to have that we didn't have. When March 12th rolled around, they shut us down. Like everyone, right. you know, the panic started ensuing. I had just returned from, to Wanda, which is like three hours away from Chicago proper. So it was out in the middle of Illinois. Um, such a blast shooting that. That was for what will be episode nine. Uh, and and I returned and all of a sudden it's all the talk that someone on another show that was at Cinespace with us had, had COVID and everyone starts panicking. And, you know, that day, the 12th, I'll never forget it. It felt like 9-11. It was like, you know, everyone was, there was no masks. The sanitizer right. had run out, you know, because people were panicking. Right. And before you know it, it's like, oh, my God, we're just sitting ducks out here and we're packed into this warehouse full of atmospheres. So you're all breathing the same air and who right. on this set might have it. It became like, you know, vision of the body snatchers or something or the thing, you know, you're like, oh, you want to do the copper wire test on everybody. <laughs> but it, so I'll never forget that day. It was like 9-11. And at the end of the day, they're like, well, we'll we'll let you know. And I look for an email tonight about whether we're showing up tomorrow or not. And sure enough, the email came. And it's like, nope, we're shut down tomorrow. Happened to be my birthday that next day. So oh. all my plans that night for going out were completely destroyed. And I'm sitting there in Chicago. My old high school buddies, God bless them. They did the first of many now Zoom calls where I had, that was the best birthday ever because all my old high school buddies got on Zoom with me. So that was just fantastic. But it was awesome. not how I envisioned spending my milestone birthday. birthday. Yeah. Um, so we shut down that Monday, uh, the 16th. I spent that whole weekend packing up my life because I'd been there for six months and flew back to L.A. not knowing when or if I'd ever go back and finish the show or whether I caught something or whether I right. caught it on the plane or, you know, it's, it's harrowing, right? So in that time, luckily, we'd shot enough where I stayed busy posting all the way through nine. And um, and then the plan started coming like, yeah, we're going to go back in August and shoot shoot the last two. And I'm like, we're not. We're not. Come on. Right. We did it. You know, we prepped and we planned. And I learned a great new term, which was fix it in prep, which Messerschmitt said a lot. And I think that was brilliant. We actually had a double amount of time, normal time to prep the episode. So there were almost no surprises on set. And there was 
very little that I wasn't ready to deal with in the moment. It made shooting so much easier for me having that extended prep period. Right. And a lot of that was just logistics for COVID. We broke it into two teams and each of those teams was broken into two subsets where you had either actor ac- actor and set access or you did not. And you had mm-hmm. your little, your little, uh, zone A badge. You know, you had your zone A if you could be in zone A or if you were on the locations team or if you were on set, you know, that's my Fargo credentials. So you were either allowed on on with the actors or you were not because they're so exposed. I mean, they're just like, there's no mask on when they're acting. So we have to make sure that we keep our stuff together so that we don't endanger them. And, you know, we're wearing masks and face shields and goggles and and washing hands a bunch of times. We had tests three times a week. So I had the old brain tickler three times a week wow. um, while we were shooting. But that week gets really expensive, doesn't it? It does get expensive for a production, but it doesn't get as expensive. I, I don't think it gets as expensive as shutting, being shut down because your star got COVID and now you've got the entire crew on lockdown for two weeks. I think that would right. be more expensive. I, I don't know sure. for sure. I, I'm not, you know, that's not my thing, but we are our set medic. He was our set medic for the early part of the season, Mike Shannon, and he became the COVID supervisor, which it's like, you know, it's like a, should, like a Darth Vader promotion almost, you know, now you're in command. You know, like, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but Mike was, Mike and his team were amazing. I never felt more safe on scouts instead of piling into the party van like we used to and go out and we were all in our own cars. So it was like in Swingers, that movie where yeah. five people show up and one in each car, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's how you do it. You know, that's how we yeah. did it. And we, 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 it's cost a little bit more. It took a little more time. There was a lot more to deal with testing. They were very strict. If, if people were standing around in circles, Mike and his team were walking around. You guys been around each other a little too long. Break it up a little too close. Make sure, making sure everybody had masks on. And they did a really great job of making everybody feel safe. And not one of us, you know, not one of us got it. I don't even need to knock wood anymore because now we're done. But we made it through three weeks of shooting um, on set and on location and the yeah. producers and the COVID team were just wonderful. So was it scary at first, but pretty soon, you know, I, I forgot I was even at first I was like, oh, I, can't, I can't breathe the mask, right. you know, like, like every wimp. But after a while I kind of was like, I didn't even realize I was wearing it. And that's in summer in Chicago where you're sweating like a pig, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but it was like, I felt safe. It was fine. You go every now and then you go around the corner for a pop it off for a mask break, you know, um, right. and you just you just get on with your job. You just you have a job to do. You just get on with your job. You're more careful. The biggest impact was, you know, Chicago is probably the funnest city I've ever been to. And the nightlife in Chicago, the restaurant scene and the bar scene is just amazing. Like the food it's the best food I've ever had right. anywhere. I, I loved it. And the people are so nice and friendly. You go out by yourself to eat dinner at the bar. Before you know it, you're tagging along with five other people you met at the bar to this this next bar or to this party right. that their friends have. And it's like the nicest group of people in the yep. world. I, I just love Chicago. And um, the hardest part, I think, the second time around was I just couldn't go out. And I wasn't going to be that guy. I'm like, eh, I'm going to go out and sneak out and not tell anybody and then be the guy that bring, that kills Chris Rock or something. You know, I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> so um, I... I uh, I just stayed in. I cooked a lot. It was like I was, you know, going like in early stages of a like the like the romance phase, the honeymoon phase of a relationship with myself, cooking for myself and playing music for myself and pouring myself some wine. Don't mind if I do, you know. Like <laughs> it was it was amazing, you know, watching uh, watching a show or something. I was catching up on some stuff that I needed to catch up on. It was yeah. So I just found a different way to enjoy it. But it was, um, you know, that was probably the the biggest difference was because. I mean, my dance card was full in Chicago. I was out every night and there was a bunch of real Italians that came over from Italy uh, to, because to, authenticity is something Noah always strives for. So there was a bunch of real, real, real Italians, you know, mm-hmm. that were there. And man, they're so much fun. And it was like having family around. So we'd be at each other's houses on weekends cooking or this one guy, Nick, his family lived in Chicago and they made us these amazing meals and homemade wine and it was like I'd, I'd go in the bathroom and just cry because it was like having my childhood back of, of all those days with my grandparents or something being at a big Italian dinners. It was right. wonderful. It was just wonderful. So I guess that's the biggest thing that has changed is that you can't you can't really do the outside of work bonding anymore that you used to do with COVID. And then there's just little roadblocks in your way sure. that, that are like, you know, that those are the only things. But you can do it. It's just everyone's got to be diligent and realize that their actions affect everyone else. Like you're not. 
you know, a little secret that people know, I think, but you're not wearing a mask for yourself. Like I'm not wearing a mask to filter out everybody else. I'm wearing a mask to keep my own stuff from infecting anybody else's. Right. Because if I don't know I'm infected, me breathing all over the place is going to kill everybody. So, right. You know, you're wearing it's the, the mask same thing for with vaccines. Else. People think vaccines is to protect you. For, vaccines is also to protect everyone else. <laughs> everyone else. Yeah. No, yeah. it's both. Yeah. For vaccines is both. And the mask is both too. It's both too. But you know, I, but it's also also not going out. I knew a lot of people that were breaking the rules left and right, and they were going out. And I broke them once or twice. We'd go to a, a patio restaurant and have a seat in the corner and, you know, with only with people who are on the same testing regimen. You know, I was a calculated risk, but I probably shouldn't have done it, you know, in retrospect. But um, I'm glad I did. But uh, if you're being – but I knew people that were just like, oh, no, I'm going out here. I'm going out there. My wife has all these friends over, and I'm like, Wow that's risky, you know, and we're lucky nothing happened, but you know, if everyone just kind of puts himself on hold for like, you're in this for a couple of weeks, you're in this for a month, right. you're doing a job here. You're lucky to have work. Just chill and don't, don't be that guy. Don't be that person who's going right. to risk everybody else, you know? And so it kind of, for me, because I love that casting crew, like I've never loved a casting crew in my life. Um, I didn't want to get any of them sick. You know, I didn't right. want to be the one responsible to hurt anybody on that set. That was the, that was the, like, we became like a family out there. And I just had a Zoom the other day, like 20 of us got on this Zoom call to like toast, toast ourselves for premiering. And it was just, you know, when you don't get that with a lot of shows, like the show's over and everyone goes their separate ways. But I've kept in touch with a lot of people from this show because we, even COVID aside, we went through something together and we had a blast together and respected and loved each other's work. And, and with COVID on top of it, you kind of, we went through a pandemic together, you know, we yeah. shot through a pandemic together yeah. and, and you just don't want to be that person. So like, I urge anybody that's on a production right now, be lucky that you have work because there's a million people who don't and, and don't be that person to bring, to bring it to set and like be the person that gets a show shut down. And there are people counting on that work and, and you know, you don't want to be that person. So anyway, that's sort of like my preach, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't really left. <laughs> I leave. <laughs> I I uh, I leave my house uh, to go fishing, and I carry oh, a nine nice. foot fishing rod with a hook on it, and I swing it around real because I fly fish now, and so no one's coming within nine feet of me because <laughs> <laughs> I swat. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah. It'd yeah, be like Hellraiser, like a low budget Hellraiser. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so that's really the only thing. And I, I do, uh, uh, Karen is now working, uh, overtime. Uh, we have a flame in mm. our bedroom. <laughs> so. Wait a minute. Oh, you mean the discrete logic product? Uh, yes. Okay. Now I, know. I was like, you're lucky for as many years as you guys have been married. That's God bless you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. We've got the we've got the uh <laughs> it's Autodesk actually that owns it. But um Oh that's anyway, right. Autodesk discreet we, back in the day. Yeah. We do have it in our in our in a room. Uh so and John she's working and she's very busy, which we're very thankful uh, as well, you know. Um yeah. but so so the, so now I'm I'm doing the grocery shopping just to give her a break from having done it when I was busy. So uh but yeah, that's it. You know, we don't we don't go anywhere. It's not uh wow. not not worth it. Yeah, so I occupy in, in myself way, other not. ways. You know? In a way, it's not, you know, and I've been enjoying some home time too, getting some projects done that I've been wanting to get done and just spending time slowing down. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've been running for so long and I, I'm, my, I'm my best self when I'm busy, you know, because yeah. when you stop and have time to really evaluate things and you realize how much stuff you, you could work on that you need to work on on yourself and in your personal life and in your financial life and whatever, it's overwhelming, scary daunting it's kind of like you know viral ayahuasca i guess or something you're kind of forced into this period of introspection that can be really scary right. um so luckily i haven't hit that yet um i'm hoping i don't <laughs> but uh I, I got a little a little whiff of it because even working an eight hour day which we were doing during during the, the during the, the the hiatus from shooting right we were doing eight hours and the occasional six day, you know, and the occasional 10 hour day, but it's not like a 14 hour day like you're used to in post when you're crunching. Right. And even that was offering me a lot more time for introspection and for things and to look at, look at my life. And, and, you know, one of the things that I realized, and I've always been like this, cause you know, you, you've known me a long time and I think mm -hmm. you can attest to this, but I kind of put it into real clarity recently that, you know, there's, there's really like two kinds of people out there. 
the people who are grateful for what they have and the people who are, are complaining about what they don't have. You know, if, if you're grateful for what you have, you're not complaining about what you don't have. It, it, right. Sure. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hypocritical. There are things I'd love to have and I complain about stuff sometimes, but those are my failings, not my, 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 uh, my core sort of like wavelength that I'm trying to operate on. I'm trying to right. operate on a, on a, on a wavelength of gratitude because so much, you know, you don't always get the best, the, what you wanted for lunch when you're on set. You get, you get what you get, but right. that's better than 90% of the people, 90% of the people on the planet are going to have on any given day on their best right. day that week. They're not going to get a meal that good. Right. So when I hear people complain about this or that, it's just like, man, you have no idea how many people out there. And I saw a lot of it in Chicago. Cause remember it wasn't just COVID going on in Chicago when I was there. We, yeah, there was, there's 30 people getting shot every weekend. Right. You know, there's a big gang war going on over there and there's, a lot of rioting and looting and I was there for the, there was a tornado warning and looting and shooting and rioting all in the same day. And I'm sitting there going, what the hell am I doing here? You know, like right. LA suddenly looked like uh, Malibu, you know, compared, looked very right. safe. But um, there's a lot of people that are really suffering out there and really hurting. And the things that I have that I'm grateful for, you know, Oh, got to go to this meeting man. be lucky. You have a meeting to go to, you know, yeah. Oh, this uh, looks like I got to have lunch at the office again. Be lucky you're busy enough that you need yeah. to be working through. And that might sound, you know, I don't want to sound preachy about it, but it is it is a mindset that I have found to be to keep my day to day in my positivity levels at an all time high. Like realizing what I've had through this and my friends that don't have work and what mm -hmm. they would give to have work. I hope that when this is all that when we've made it sort of through this, I'm not going to say back to normal because that's never going to happen. That, that's, that, that's something people got to just get their head around. There, there's no back mm -hmm. to normal now. Things are going to be different. Mm -hmm. But once we, once, once unemployment, you know, production's back up again, people are working again. It's, I hope people remember this and that are more grateful for what they will have on the other side of this. I know I, I know I will be, and yeah. I know that I, I am. And, and I don't look back at, at my recent years with a lot of regret, having lived through like you did, the shrinking of the industry, which right. by the way, I want to touch on that. Cause that's super funny. Now it's kind of funny that, you know, our industry died in LA when it all went to Vancouver for tax subsidies. Right and now Vancouver has been dying off to go to Montreal and to see the, to see the people in Mont Vancouver complaining about that. It's really hilarious. What they're chasing the subsidy and they're taking our worry. Like, Mm, I warn you about this. Did you just copy and paste all the shit we were saying uh, 10 <laughs> years ago? Cause I don't feel too sorry for you, bud. Cause you know, no. like, you know, sorry. I love Vancouver and I, I love the people in Vancouver and the city. It is such a wonderful city and so much fun. And do, am, am I glad that's happening? It's not no the problem. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the problem is if I move to Vancouver, the then the next time I have to move to Montreal and then next I got to right. move to wherever another else, great yeah. city, but it is, yeah. it is jarring and disorienting to have to do that for me. Again, I've been very fortunate that I got to supervise a team in Los Angeles and Vancouver. So I got to experience, I got to go back and forth. I didn't have to move. But, you know, I got to, I got to enjoy teams in both sides of the border. I got to enjoy two different cities. I got to go to Montreal and enjoy the people of Montreal, wonderful people and a beautiful city, beautiful city. <clears throat> so, I mean, again, for me, that gratitude of being grateful that I get to have these experiences, you know, I get to go stay in a hotel in Vancouver or, or a furnished living place where I have my own kitchen and laundry. I mean, my God, I'm so lucky to have had that experience and to get to meet a whole bunch of new people that I normally would not have met. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that's again, that position of gratitude, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's an important, it's an important mindset for me. Cause I think in this industry, you know, again, it boils down to like, Oh, they want to change the whole scene. And now we've got, you know, three weeks to change all this stuff. It's like, are you complaining that you only have three weeks to finish all this stuff? Or are you grateful for the, that for the chance to get to contribute to a new vision for the sequence, you know, like it sounds corny, but it, I've learned, I've trained myself to, for that to become a natural response in most cases. And when it's not, I let myself down and I let myself down plenty. I'm no saint, you know, but I, I have plenty of thetans running around in my head. But like, uh, really? Oh, I'm on a list really? now. Uh oh, I'm on a list now. No, but it's like, you know, it, uh, they're going to get me. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a way to enjoy more hours of the day for me. It's selfish. It's selfish. That's what it is. It's so I get to be happy for more, more, more of the day than I would if I just sat there and 
bitched about it. That's not going right. to get anything done. If I'm that miserable, I should find a different job or I should quit. You know, it's as simple as that. And I have those days, but you know, all in all, this business has been, I never dreamed I'd get as far as I did in 2006 when we were working together on iRobot, much less mm -hmm. where I am now. I never dreamed I'd have got this far. So that's why I was so frozen by Victoria's question that day, because honestly, I never thought I'd get as far as I got <clears throat> um, at that point, much less now. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm lucky yeah. for it all. Lucky for it all. Yeah. I, you know, the, here's the way that I've been looking at this situation. I, I, similar to you, I've been trying to find a lot of positive things and be grateful for all the things, right? On top of the fact that I'm grateful that I have a job and I still have lots of work to do, right? I am, I'm grateful for that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also grateful for the fact that I don't have to drive from Burbank to Culver City, city every day. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm. That's two hours of my yeah. life that I didn't realize how much more I can get done. And it's not just about getting done for work, how much more time I can spend with my kids, how much more I can enjoy cooking, how much more I can uh, spend sure. some time. You know, you know, after work, I'm just going to pour myself a scotch and tie a Clouser minnow and, and get that going and get some more bucktail ordered. And, you know, like those are things that like ah. I never enjoyed those things. And now I do. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm looking at I'm actually really looking at the situation. Listen, this is a terrible situation. Like you said, lots of people are losing their jobs. Yeah. Lots of people are doing that. <clears throat> and honestly, that's what gives me more anxiety is not my own misfortune. Definitely. It's other people's Definitely. misfortune. Absolutely. Um, and, and I, uh, so that does give me anxiety in a lot of ways. And I do feel bad for my kids. My daughter just started high school and she's high school in zoom first. That's not cool. You know, that she's missing out on something that she really wants to experience. Um, yeah. I hated so, school. So, so zoom school would have been great for me. <laughs> <laughs> kind of with you on that one, but not, you know, not necessarily for her, but the thing is I'm, I'm. I, I'm vowing to myself, and I've sort of said it at the, you know, back in March, I said, I'm going to come out of this, kind of come out of hibernation, a bigger, stronger bear than I went into hibernation with, you know, I, I want to come out of this. I want to learn new things. I want to come mm -hmm. out of this with a new, mature, stronger, and in a better position than I've ever been, because this is actually the greatest opportunity that we have to grow as a person. Absolutely. We, you are you are isolated and you have to focus on yourself and you are po that you you have the greatest opportunity to to, to be a better person um and it's true uh and i think you're absolutely yeah. right and you took that responsibility when you went back on set it's like you know what i'm going to be a very responsible person on set and take that responsibility and make sure no one gets hurt so that's well, great. take it seriously i mean it's literally life or death there's a lot of people out there who don't believe it and you know maybe someday i'll be proven wrong and the whole thing was a hoax i, I can't imagine it but maybe i will but Maybe 200,000 people didn't die by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, there'll be denialists, I'm sure. There's a lot of conspiracy Well, someone was, someone was telling fine, me but, the other day, it's like, it's like you know, well, it's like, it's like a thousand people died today from this. As one of those, and the guy says, well, you know, just as many people die in a bathtub. It's like, really? I think if a thousand people died in a bathtub today, there'd be laws about bathtubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of silly. I mean, you die in a car crash, you die in this, you die in that, sure, die heart disease, you know, and no one's coming down. Yeah, but you know what we do? Know. We have seat belts in cars <laughs> yeah. to prevent yeah, no, you're that. Exactly to make right. the, you're exactly know? right. Exactly right. Exactly right. There would be a lot more people dying if we didn't do that stuff. And, but either way, whether it, you know, it's, turns out to be a hoax or whatever. I don't know, but it's not for me to take other people's lives. I'm being paid by a production yeah. and I'm being told that this is their policy. Yeah. That's all that I needs to be said. That's it. Yep. You know, I mean, I have plenty of outlaw tendencies. I, I kind of view the law as a guideline, but when it comes to like something like this, if I'm wrong, someone might die. Yeah. If someone I really like yeah. might die. You know, it's not like I can, typhoid marry someone I don't like because everybody that I'm dealing with, I really like, you know, and right. I don't want to be that guy, you know, like, so it's not, you know, gambling with somebody else's life, you know, and, and people in your own house too, you don't want to be gambling with their lives either. I just, I know, I know people that are, that think it's a hoax or that don't believe it or think it's being hyped and, you know, God bless them. I hope, I hope they're right. And I hope nothing happens to them, but, but I, I'm not willing to take that chance. You know, I'm not willing to take that chance, not for myself and not for people I care about. You know, no right. way. That said, I have gotten a lot more comfortable about, I had, I had a little heart scare and I, I went for, um, you know, an, a stress echocardiogram, you know, back in March. Let wow. me tell you, 
One of the things you really don't want to do at the beginning of a respiratory pandemic is get on a treadmill with a mask on and run until you're out of breath in a room with three other people. You just don't want to do that. That's you don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. like I, that's the worst thing you could do. But I, I thought, you know, if I don't do this, I, I could. I might have something a lot worse. So I wanted mm -hmm. to get it taken care of and looked at it. And, and um, so, so I've, I started with that and then going fly, do, doing three flights during a pandemic, shooting for three weeks during a pandemic and moving to another city and, and, and living there and doing the, dealing with the grocery deliveries or going to get to the store even. You know, I've kind of become more comfortable with it. And what I've learned now is like that I'm back here. I'm going to take some calculated risks and I am going to go to some patio rooftops because otherwise some of these places I love to go are going to go out of business. And I'm one of the handful of lucky people in a position where I can go have a meal or, or happy hour drinks with, with somebody. And I, I have, I have a job so I can buy dinner for a friend who doesn't, or I can go out with somebody and help this business stay afloat. And so I'm going to do a lot more of that kind of thing. Outdoor seating, wear the mask until the waiter comes, you know, be, be careful as much as I can, but at a certain point, you know, life does go on and, and I, I'm a very social person and I like to go out and I like to see people. And it's really hard for me to just be stuck at, at, at home all the time. You know, I, I've, I've enjoyed bits of it, finding that silver lining, you know, but I also miss people. I, I'm a, I miss people. I mean, that's the whole thing about this business. That's the other great thing about this job is that I'm the only department that like, like, set deck isn't really working with wardrobe you know production right. design isn't isn't always working with you know production design is working with 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 the whole show but when when a wardrobe malfunction happens vfx is going to work with them to fix it when makeup is something falls short on makeup or someone's sweating and they keep coming through it vfx is there to help when hair is having trouble with the little netting or whatever you're, you're there to help right every single department on that set props this prop isn't really not holding up close to camera Okay, great. I can I can help fix it, and and that's another beauty of it is that people person aspect of things. And I just um, I just love that so much working with all these kooky, wild like it's like gypsy, summer camp for gypsies, and you just right. you know. So I'm gonna start going out. I mean, that's the long and short of it. I'm gonna start going out and start calculated risks. You know. Okay. All I right. gotta I gotta be me. Well, baby. the other thing is you also have you know as part of the whole process of what this is. You know, besides writers, <laughs> we're one of the only other parts of the of the process that can work from home in a oh, lot yeah. of ways. Oh, and yeah. what's uh, what's also interesting, I mean, I think you'll agree to this. You, know, you remember how n everyone always told us, like, there's no way that you would ever be able to work from home in visual effects. And then suddenly when there was no choice, everyone's working from home. <laughs> you know? Well, I, you know, I think, honestly, we were able to adapt to that largely because of the outsourcing. Right. You know, a lot of the technology that was put in place back in the early 2010s type area in order to let, let me be able to run a team in another country, mm -hmm. that technology had to be there. All the Teradici boxes and, and that sort of remote workstation business. I mean, I have one this right behind me here. I'm, I, I can log into Zoic and work on my box at Zoic. I have access to the network. I do CineSync. So, do, you know, that technology, it happened for us kind of overnight, largely because we already got used to working with companies over, over in other countries. And so there, there we go. There was a silver lining for the, for that. I mean, I'm not going to say that was a silver lining for everybody because a lot of people didn't make it through that, that period. Mm -hmm. And they're in other industries now and missing out and miserable or whatever, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's tragic, but I'm one of the lucky ones that did make it through and we're reaping the benefit of that. Now that I'm able to work from home, do I want to go back to the office? Yeah. I missed my drive time. I'm like you. I use that time. That's the only time as a supervisor. That's the only time that I have to myself. If I'm at in the office, someone's at my desk to show me something or to bring me to someone else's desk. And I love that. I want to be at someone else's desk looking at work. Right. And if, you know, and if I'm home, I want to focus on my kids or, but I was in that car for, if I'm in that car for an hour driving to Paramount, that's a good chance for me to call my mom, catch up with my mom. Yeah. Good chance for me to call my sister, my buddy I haven't talked to in a while. Or just sit and listen to some music and just be alone and decompress. So I, I kind of miss my drive times to some degree. But again, I also love being able to eat dinner at five o'clock and not be like awake at midnight with a bellyache because I ate too late. Right. You know, so silver linings, baby, all around. Yeah. Like whatever ends up happening when we go back, it would be great to go back to work three days a week and have two days at home or, or mix it up a little bit. Or you know what? Tonight I'm leaving at five. 
because I want to go have dinner with a friend. And then when I get home, I'll log back in from my garage and I will look at shots tonight. You know, yeah. that's going to be something that I, that I think will be a, a real positive that comes out of all this. A lot of people a lot being able to work from yeah. home, you yeah. know, um, like I hope too many people don't get hurt in, in that process. And I hope that people are able to maintain employment through that. But I, that's, that's like you said, that's the most stressful part of this whole thing is knowing how many people are out there suffering. And, you know, it's, um, I almost feel guilty for how lucky I've been through all this. Yep. Um, you know, and I, I, I know that a lot of that is because of my hard work, but I also know that I'm flat out lucky, flat out lucky, right place at the right time, right show at the right time. There's other people at Zoic that their show just wrapped and they delivered it right when this hit and they're, they haven't worked since. I was lucky that I was my cycle of the show was timed in a way that I was able to stay busy this whole time. Mm. So none of that is taken for granted. None of that is like rolling my eyes. I got to do this now. It's like, no man, I'm lucky, lucky to be able to do this right now. I'm lucky to have this task to do right now. Sure. You want me to do a roto call out or QC a shot? My God, thank you. I'm so happy to have that. You know, it's, yeah. again, it just sounds so like Oliver twisty, but it is, <laughs> it is a time in my opinion, it is a time for us to look at what we have and, and evaluate what we want to keep when we're on the other side of this versus what we might want to get rid of. Yeah. I hope everybody yeah. learned a little bit of how to slow down maybe, you know, cause that's something I've, I have really enjoyed. I've had more time to talk to my family. I've had more time to call friends. Zoom. Well, I do you have, Zoom happy definitely have more time to be more introspective. And I think some of us need a little bit of that, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, you know, how, you know, you'd be thankful for what you have. And I definitely am, but it also made me very ambitious. Like I became much more ambitious from this process. Oh, like totally, I wasn't sitting yeah. there completely, you know what I mean? And ambitious means I want more and I feel like I can attain it now. And, and somehow yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm trying, like I said, I am trying to be as positive as possible coming out of this. And, and yeah. it sounds like you're doing the same thing. Um, Totally. But, I mean, I but, learned Unreal through all this, man. Like, <laughs> I've been, I've always struggled with with previs because, like, I hate relying on someone else and their their availability to get yeah. a visual together, especially in television. Like, a director's going to be prepping for two weeks, shooting for two weeks, and that's it. So for me to be able to call and get a resource, oh, they're busy on this other show right now, and you can get them tomorrow. Okay, that's one day. Then they do something. I explain it to them. The next day, it's not quite right. I kick it back. Three days go by before I can show the director. That's a measurable percentage of time that has been lost mm -hmm. in planning the shot. So I figured that's it. I'm going to learn an Unreal. And this is before all this Mandalorian nonsense took over. And I'm going to call it nonsense for a reason. Uh, I'll get to that in a sec if I still have time to talk. But, it, um, <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I wanted to learn this so that I could sit on my laptop, bust out a quick previs, show the director, okay, this is what we're doing. Even if we can't use it, we have a visual representation of what it is that we are doing. I right. can plan a motion control shoot, which we did. Right. I can plan, um, you know, what the asset's going to look like, what kind of lens, how close are we going to get, so they can start working the asset back at, um, at the facility. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what the shot's going to be. Editorial has a slug piece to sit in there now all based on the fact that I spent some time to learn Unreal and can do previs in it now. And oh, it feels like I've, I feel like I've gained a superpower. Mm -hmm. But this Mandalorian business, the reason I say nonsense, it's, it's awesome. It's basically an updated version of the old Cary Grant driving the car in Alfred Hitchcock movie. Right. That, that's really what it is. It's, there's no mystery. There's no magic to it. If you look at the behind the scenes, you would think that everything was shot in camera and kept in camera. And that's a dangerous thing for everyone to be thinking because they went back and redid a lot of that stuff. No one's talking about it. They went back and redid a lot of, they went back, you went back and redid a lot of that work through a traditional pipeline. And you know, you did, you know, you did. So I just want everyone to know that, you know, there's shots. You look at the behind the scenes, the Mandalorian's got a green box that they're projecting behind him through the camera frustrum. Right. Because they know that those assets need to hold up. And they're just not at a high quality. The what they so are they're gonna going get, back and work. So they're getting rendering. lighting though. They're getting lighting. They're getting lighting. And that's wonderful. You can get lighting with half baked assets. No problem. And then if someone decides to change everything, you're kind of stuck with that lighting, but it's very the, expensive the, for the, lighting though. <laughs> right. The stuff the actors are seeing 
it helps them stay in the mood. It helps them stay in the moment. I'm yes. all for it. I hate shooting in a blue box or a green box. I hate it. Yeah. So I'm all for that stuff. But everyone's got to understand <clears throat> that this is not, this is like digital snake oil. It's like, it's not, you can't just walk into a meeting, and, well, uh, you know, and say like, oh, you know, we're just going to do the Mandalorian thing. Like, <laughs> oh, just, you're just going to do the Mandalorian thing. Okay, great. Just push a button and it all does itself. There were thousands of people working their butts off on that show to make it look so good. I know. And some of the stuff held up in camera and some stuff didn't. <clears throat> and to be, you know, I, I just don't want studio executives to think that they're being robbed later when they're when they realize that it's going to take time to go back and rebuild the stuff to get it to that quality level that that show deserved you know what i mean like that's really my beef with it is just like be honest about what its limitations are and own that own those limitations you know an sure. led wall is is great for car comps you're in a fighter starship or something and you got out hey, we had that on like stealth stealth they could have worked <laughs> on stealth like a that would have been amazing right we kind you know, of did you, that, didn't they? Didn't they try? Oh, it's something. Yeah. Kinda. They did kind of try it, but I mean, to have something that the gimbal and the camera yeah. and everything else will work together with unreal, the appropriately named unreal. Amazing. That would be, that would have been amazing, but it is, but it is not for everything. It is not like, Hey, we're in COVID right now. We've got this restaurant scene. Let's just Mandalorian this. Use it as a verb. Like, come on guys. What are you doing? Did they doing? really say like, that? I have heard that. I have heard that term. You could just Mandalorian that. And then, you know, like you, there's no just any part of it. That is, that was a monumental breakthrough in visual effects. That's like the, that was like what we, what happened with the matrix and how everything sort of like changed after that or Jurassic park, what right. the Mandalorian pulled off is, is epic. It's I keep like using these unintentional puns. It's, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it was, it was also it's a next level. Also, of, of, I just want to say that if people think that that was all lit in unreal, they are misguided. <laughs> I'm just going to say that because Correct. I don't think that was all real time. I mean, it was real time, but the lighting wasn't. <laughs> I'll the just say wasn't. that. Yeah. Pre-bake projections. There's a, and then there was a lot of flat out roto and redo or key the Mandalorian yep. from that green slice that they have behind him. Yeah. And, and run those assets. You get to a point in your asset tree where you fork it. You've got your, your unreal slash stagecraft and you have your, Renderman pipeline for ILM or V-Ray mm -hmm. for, for most of the rest of us. And you have, you have your fork in the road and then you're going to go back and redo those backgrounds sometimes, right. sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. And there's limitations to how much you can move the camera. There's limitations to how wide your lens can be. Suddenly the her refresh rate is out of sync with, and you have a, a stutter behind a camera pan. I mean, there's, it's not, it's it, it's digital snake you oil. You can't do long shots where you focus on the LED bulbs <laughs> and everything. Can't do it. So, yeah, yeah. It's gonna yeah. yeah every, every but people seem to think that it is a panacea or it is a it's a snake oil. You know, I think of that scene in Outlaw Josie Wales where it'll cure your rheumatism and your arthritis and it'll cure right. us and that and the other. You know, it's not. Well, it's not that. Yes, there. It's not that. Listen, uh, but. I think virtual production, which is a term that everyone's throwing around right now, I'm totally with you. Virtual production has the potential to do massive good changes to the industry, just like you Absolutely. were outlining. It's Absolutely. just, and, and the problem I also have is exactly like, it's like we'll just Mandalorian it. Doesn't make any sense <sighs> either. Doesn't because what people are doing is they're taking something and not actually fixing the real problem. The real problem is the Hollywood pipeline itself. You can't just shoehorn virtual production into the system and say, done. Because then it gets, yeah. it doesn't work that way. And mm -mm. trust me, I know because I have been working on trying to figure out virtual production solutions for the last six years. Uh, and I really believe that there's going to be some amazing things that we're going to be able to do once when we start doing a lot more of this stuff in real time. All of this real-time ray tracing has been where my mind has gone, and the only thing that really excites me about it is virtual production. Ever virtual since production I did that, is awesome. Ever it's, since it's I did all, that construct awesome. thing, it was like, oh, shit, we're going to change filmmaking. This filmmaking is going to be exciting again, especially when... You know, and this is the thing, Lou, you, you know this 
now so much more because you, you've been on set so much more and you've seen so these, all these, this talent that you see on set, like the DPs and stuff, and you've had much more direct interaction with them. I, if I'm as, you know, lowly lighter on iRobot and I wish I had access to some great DPs to teach me how to light something properly. And the first right. time I actually <clears throat> learned that lesson is when Eric Nash, a great DP, sat next to me and going, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Why do you have <laughs> 75 lights in your scene? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, eh. And it's like, oh gosh, you know, if I was going to let, you know, yeah. like I learned so much from that process. And yeah. when you do virtual production, suddenly all those guys, you mentioned it earlier, all those guys that say they hate CG. The reason they hate CG is because they don't know where, they put it into this magic box and crap comes out the other end and they have mm -hmm. no idea what it is. But if you put them in virtual production, say, okay, you actually have control of this. I'm giving you the lights. I'm giving you the content. I'm giving you the camera. You get to mm -hmm. use the camera again and the DP is using a virtual camera and can actually, this is how, shoot. they're going to start loving CG again. <laughs> Because well, I don't think it's they'll ever really love CG. They will. They just won't know that it's CG. They'll well, forget. Or they're going to love you know, filmmaking like, again. It just happens to yeah. be in CG. They'll love. They'll love working on visual effects shows because it is. It is very soul sucking to go onto a set that's a big green box and you just like, oh god, nobody. The DPs don't want to be there. Nobody. Yeah. How are you going to light in that thing? The actors are looking around like, God, get me out of here. You know, nobody wants to be in a big green box. I mean, I use blue screen. I'm a blue screen kind of guy. Blue Lou, baby, Blue Lou. Um, <laughs> that's what one of the grip, Manny Duran, one of the grips that I've been working with the last couple of years, he, he made up that name for me. They're yeah, like, you want to use green screen? He's like, who, Blue Lou? He's never going to use green screen. I got a truck <laughs> full of blue for him, you know? Like, That's right, baby. But it, you don't want to do that because it's soul sucking and it, 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 it's not what you want. And I'm excited by virtual production. Don't get me wrong. I, I love the idea of it. <clears throat> I just, my beef with it is that I don't want people to think, I, I think that when people use it as a verb or when use it as, use it as a, like a just, just, that right. it's disrespectful of the hundreds of people that go into making that work. Yes. Hundreds of people on, on both sides of the production. You know, when you're, when you're the prep work that goes into making the assets that get projected, the technicians and artists that are working on the projections themselves and making sure that that tech is running and those screens are lit. And that is a lot of work for a lot, for people to make, to keep it going. Yep. The props are in the right place at the right time. The art directors are working their butts off on that. They're like, Oh God, I got to make sure that that prop is in there. That, that, that CG asset wasn't done yet. Someone's got to keep track of that, you know, and that kind of stuff. That's a lot of people doing a lot. It's the same problem when people say just VFX it or can't you just CG that? Like, yeah, okay. yeah sure, post. of course. But I want you to understand <laughs> that's fine. Fix it in post is fine. And using the verb CG something to me and using the term Mandalorian that it's disrespectful of the thousands, the hundreds and sometimes thousands of people's time and effort and artistry and technical ability that's going into making that. And that's that's the thing that I think as an industry, we've done ourselves an incredible disservice by these shot builds where you can see a shot that took two months to put together and it wipes on in three seconds. And people see that and they're like, why was that so expensive? Like that was expensive because that was 15 people working around the clock for two months to make that look that good. You know, right. come on. Like, and don't you just push the dinosaur button and people make that joke as if they know that that's not what it takes, but then they're the same ones that forget that that's what it takes. And that right. is what it takes. It takes a lot of people's hard work, talent, dedication, sacrifice, I'm missing my kid's graduation because I got to get this thing done. I mean, there's stuff like that that happens. Mm -hmm. And that's not just push a goddamn button. That's not what it is. And it's it's not going to go away. The same thing is going to happen with these virtual production screens, the first few shows that go in when they get the reality that it's not just like, oh, we just did that all on camera. It was so easy. <laughs> it, it's, it's still a lot of work. It's still a lot of work that a lot yeah. of people, human beings, have to do. And that, that's something I just wish that I could bang through the heads of everybody who's at a certain level of detachment from the actual process that I wish they understood that there are a lot of people I've brought, I've brought some of the actors that I've worked with in the last few years. I've forged friendships with and mm -hmm. directors and DPs, and I've brought them to Zoic to, to walk around and they're all, they all say the same thing. I had no idea it took this many people to put stuff together. I'm like, that's because you've, you're usually on your third cocktail at a premiere by the time that part of the credits is rolling after the caterers are done. But mm -hmm. there is, it's like a Tolstoy novel of text going, right. <laughs> going up yeah. of yep. people all over the world that worked on this. And so this is just one office. We got three offices working on this show. 
And this is like the mid-sized one. There's a bigger one up in Vancouver. So like, I think it's important for people to understand what goes into doing this work. And and the virtual production thing I fear is going to be the latest, the latest like gloss over like, ah, it's not real people. It's just computers. Like, no, it, it's people, man. It, it is people. Working. I don't think so. I, I actually don't think so. I think it's, I, I feel differently. I re, if, if virtual production is done properly, it's actually going to empower the film, the people that were like, I don't know, just do it in post. It's going to put them in the driver's seat and say, no, no, you, you do it because we're giving yeah. you the tools. And now, now you have to be a, you have to be a director again <laughs> or a DP again. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, that's uh, right. You get, yeah. You get to be a DP. Yeah. You get to be a DP. Shoot. Yep. Yeah. As opposed to like, calling it in, you make sure the face is right. And then the blue screens are just, just try not to look. How at many yeah, times right. we get crappily lit shots with just a plate. And I'm like, how am I supposed to match this? And it's like, because they yeah. never cared. They never cared about lighting it properly. So. Well, also yeah. they just go into it knowing one thing they know this and how can they know what's, what's going to go out there? You know, right. like, so a lot of times that becomes another thing that that's very difficult for people to do too. They're used to using certain filters and things on a camera and like, well, you do that, and now I have to map all that so that it can go into the CG. That's fine. That's what I want right. to do. But on a blue screen shoot, it's, again, soul-sucking for everybody involved. Nobody wants it. CG people don't want it. Compers don't want it. DPs don't want it. Talent certainly doesn't want it. I mean, and that's who you really got to make sure you're keeping happy because you, you'll get another shot to do the VFX on something. But you you might get another shot to reshoot something. But, you know, you're in that gold mine getting... You're in the diamond mind collecting the diamonds for all intents and purposes once. And that's when those cameras are there and when the talent is there in front of the camera. And you got to do everything you can to make sure that you're focused on collecting those diamonds and then cut them up later. You know, check, check them for flaws, do your carving on them, faceting, whatever. Do that later. Right now, just get these diamonds because that's the only thing you can't do later is go back and, and reacquire this material. Right now, it's all about acquisition and and making sure that you're getting the best performance out of your talent that you can stay out of their way, keep the blue screens out of their way, keep the shiny balls out of their way, you know, like let them do their thing, help them do their thing, you know, and right. I think virtual production will help with some of that, but I meant, I meant more like not necessarily directors and DPs, but more like there will be a lot of financial pressure to, what do you mean you got it? I thought we were just going to, right. you know, what do you mean you got to redo this? I thought we got it in camera. I'm like, let's show it to you. It's, <clears throat> this is what the limit. I just want people to be honest about the limitations. Right. And about, yeah, it's not going to solve everything. You're absolutely, it doesn't right. solve everything. And there's still a lot of people that are going to be working a lot of hours, which is going to cost a lot of money to do visual effects. It's not going to like solve all those problems, you know? Mm. So that's, that's my man. I'm on that soapbox a lot today. Jeez, Chris, what are you doing to me? I don't not doing anything, Lou. You're just being honest. You're being yourself. You're being good. Yeah. I think people need to hear this information because I think it's very good, and I think it's it, it's it's really good stuff. Well, I'm sure However, I'll get a lot of hate for a lot. You're of not I'll get a lot of hate. For, you're not going to get hate. <laughs> the only people that are going to give you hate are people that are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that preemptively because I'll just quote <laughs> that as my response. If I... No, I think it's really. I think it's. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's really cool. You know, I learned so much. Uh, from from all of uh, you know people like you, people like Rienzo, and people like Xtap, and 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 understanding you know what it takes to make uh, 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 an, a final image beautiful, and um, and that's that was a big lesson for me because I was just a CG guy before that, you know, and it wasn't until mm -hmm. I got that experience and I sat down with you guys and I worked on those shows with you guys that I really learned so much. So I really appreciate everything that I learned from you guys. I appreciate you saying so, but that's a two way street. I learned a ton from you too. I was afraid to ask some questions because some lighters would just be like, you're a supervisor and you don't know that. And you're just like, <laughs> no, I don't. That's why I'm asking, but I'm going to ask somebody who's going to actually focus on the answer instead of being a diac. <laughs> I go over and talk to this other person. You know, you were one of those people yeah. I could always pull aside you and Waisler and, you know, I could always pull you guys aside and PG too. I could always pull PG aside, but I was definitely going to get that initial, like, come on out of PG, <laughs> which I grew to really miss. I need I, I, that initial wave of condescension was super fun for me um, with Paul. Cause he's just such an awesome guy. Um, yeah. But then you get, you get like a scientific answer of like, Oh, now I understand it. Okay. That's why you can't do this in CG. That's why you need this. That's why I shouldn't grade your HDR. Duh. Okay. Now I understand. 
you know, I learned just as much from, from you and, 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 and your lot as the other way and it's coming That's together cool. a lot with unreal now. i like explaining things <laughs> yeah oh i know you do i know you do but you're good at it you know you're, you're good at it and you have a very you're not gonna you're not gonna just like talk out of your butt you're gonna like you understand what you're talking about and if you don't know you're gonna figure it out like you know let me get back to you on that and that's yeah, yeah. a perfectly acceptable answer i do that all the time i'll get you know one of the creatives i'm working with the director somebody's like how are we gonna do x y and z you know what let me come up with a plan to get back to you. I don't want to spin some BS right now yeah, and yeah. get everybody scared. Let me figure that out. And then yeah. I'll run them two or three solutions the next day or something and then go from there. I mean, Noah challenged me a lot with that. On, on Lucy in the Sky, you know, I don't know how many people saw that movie, but there were these Gursky-style oversized tiles that we did, like these uh -huh. super wide images that were impossibly wide. And I think they just kind of came and went in the movie and nobody realized really what we were doing. But there's people walking around in those. And there's camera movement 3d movement through an impossibly wow. wide tile and i don't know that anybody really ever caught that and i, I was on the nash was the first guy i called him like how in the hell am i going to do this because it took me a couple of weeks to figure out how to do it but we did figure it out and it's in the movie if you watch it you'll see the bowling wow. alley scene there's a shot in there that you cannot get you physically can't get and yet we got it and it's it's super cool and you know and noah challenged me with that it was like wow you know how the hell am i going to pull this off and right and a perfectly acceptable answer was i don't know but i will figure it out and uh i love the challenge i'll get back to you you know i could I have spun some bs but i deserve yeah. a better he deserved better than bs you know he deserved an honest answer yeah it's yeah. Let's see if i could find him in cindy I'll link or something but it is uh that show was really fun and had a lot of challenges on it or visual yeah. effects, things that you'd never guess for VFX are in that thing. That, I mean, I'd love yeah. to, if you guys have, if you have any like, you know, behind the scenes videos or anything of that nature, give it to us so that we can put it in the show links so people can check out, uh, check out that. I got to get it cleared through the proper channels first. I promise <laughs> yes. I will. <laughs> you don't have, you have a couple of weeks, so. <laughs> you never know who's watching this. So I got to make sure that everybody knows. I'm not going <laughs> to sneak any footage around here. I get it approved through the proper channels and then link it the right way. <laughs> leak it the right way. <laughs> link, link it the right way. Not leak it the right way. Dude, I, I, I'll, I'll be an outlaw in my own time. Not in my, not in my client's time. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Like that's take all your responsibility. Well, Lou, right. thank you so much, man. It's always great to talking to you. And you know, I told, I really, really miss working with you. Uh, but, oh, brother, uh, mutual. Yeah, mutual. Yeah, yeah. Stay strong. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, thanks for doing it, and you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's gonna be. Be a lot of fun. I'm trying to get Rienzo on as well. Uh, oh, nice! Uh, Can we? He's, uh, uh, so he's, he's dealing with some some uh, stuff right now, so he doesn't have time. But uh, mm -hmm. hopefully, at some point, I'll get him on. I haven't uh, talked so. to him in years. I got to give him a call. I've just been. I just have been so like R Rienzo and Niederhorst and you know, so many yeah. people that I've that I need to call. Oh. It's been too long. But I've been so you know, busy that I just haven't been able to. I, I, I do a second podcast called Martini Giant uh, that you may or may not know about, but it's uh, it's um, Dan Thrawn and Eric Sheely who are both on it. <laughs> oh, two of my favorites. I love those guys. So they, I just I was telling them, it's like, yeah, I got to go because I got to do a little podcast with Lou. And they're like, oh my God, Lou. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very excited. I'll send yeah. those guys my love. I love those guys. They're they're two of my favorite guys to just sit and, and, yeah. and shoot the shit with. They're really fun, really smart guys with a, with a lot of fun stuff to say. Thrawn is... His knowledge of movies and his inter his his well, Sheely too. Movies is unparalleled. And Sheely's Sheely's just so like so creative in the moment. You know, he's creative, period. But yeah, he's so fast and so witty and so funny. And he's, his thought process is is um, so is so interesting. You know, and he also both, can have he can throw like twenty five ideas at you before you even come up with one <laughs> on totally. the creative side. Yeah. Totally. I, I love that. I love that. I find, yeah. I find that exhilarating. And those guys are two, two of my favorites. I really enjoy um, spending time with those cats. Yeah. So yeah, if you ever uh, need a Eric, guest on your martini one, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. Uh, take me uh, up on yeah. That. Eric's been actually working with Ted Andre, believe it or not. On the, I know thing. they've been developing this thing with this, uh, well, this, For a long I'm not going to say it, but yep. developing it. Yeah. While wow. Eric, Eric sh showed me stuff early on. He's like so excited about it. And, yeah, watching him talk about it and the passion he had for it, I really hope it it goes through. And Ted too. Ted's such a good guy. He he's worked so hard and and he just deserves a, a big break, you know. And I yeah. know that whoever gives him that break will reap a reward of having someone who's talented, loyal, and um, 
I remember very a, specifically. A really it was guy. it was you. You say a lot of things that I that 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 stick in my brain. But I remember very specifically. You know, people were giving Eric a lot of hard time because Eric's always goofing around, right? His his insecurity oh, yeah. his insecurity is to constantly be funny so that he no one takes him seriously because he's insecure, right? And I always joke about that with him because I love him. I love him dearly. He's a very, love very him. good friend of mine. But I remember very specifically when you, you know, he, he kept coming up with creative ideas and people were joking around about him at, at DD. But you looked at him and you said, you're so creative. One day we'll all be working for you. And, totally. uh, and, and you said that and it was, he was taken aback because no one had actually given him that compliment before. And I think I remember that I was like, and I was like, Lou is absolutely right. It's like, I totally, his, totally. his, he's got some really great ideas. And, uh, I think totally. he's, uh, he's, yeah. His danger Tokyo shirt is like the greatest shirt that was never made. I thought that was one of the most brilliant ideas. When he explained it to me, I was like, oh my God, this is genius. <laughs> and you know, his missing Mia shirt is so yeah. good too. Yeah. I mean, he's. He's actually made shorts. He's done stuff. I mean, I, yep. I'd love to work for him someday. No, no yeah. problem. I'd work for him in a heartbeat. Uh, help yeah. him do whatever the, the hell he's doing. And I think yeah. par partly I said that just to kind of like I don't like a situation where people are picking on people, you know. Right. And I've been guilty of picking on people in the past without knowing it, you know, thinking I was funny and in turn hurting people. And and it horrifies me to think back and, and think about that. But yeah, when I see it for what it is in myself, I'm like <gasps> stopping my tracks and apologizing. And, Stupid, 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 you know? Right. But when I see it happening to somebody else, I try to stop it in its tracks as well. Cause it's like that gang up on somebody and beat them up thing is just like, it's not at all what I want to be around at right. all. You know, so it's gotta be a place where people feel safe to put out some crazy ideas. And at some point someone's going to say some stuff that is, it's like, all right, that's probably, you have some great ideas, but I think we've had enough of them for the day. Give us a break from these great ideas. So those can sink in, you know, right. and sometimes I can understand that too. We got to get some work done in between all these great ideas and goofing around. But, um, there's a way to say that without, without belittling them or making them feel like they have to do more of that, you know, like it, it becomes a cycle right. of, a, of like dysfunction that I just don't want any part of. Like everyone's ideas have, have merit and, you know, and even even if not all of everyone's ideas have merit, some everyone's going to have something to throw into this thing that's going to be of merit and of value. And it's just not cool to like summarily shut somebody down. And I remember that happening to Eric sometimes over there. Yeah, I felt like he took it in stride, but I see now what you mean. I didn't think about it until just now that he was really internalizing a lot of that and it would come out yeah. later. I didn't really think about that, but like, I know I'm, I feel relieved now that I never indulged in that, you know, cause I, I always yeah. loved, I took it very seriously. Very I, I mean, I, I loved Eric and I listen, Eric is very self-deprecating. Uh, uh, and, uh, it's, you know, uh, <laughs> what's my, my impression of Eric is like, Eric, you, you shouldn't be so insecure. He goes, you think I'm insecure? <laughs> <laughs> totally. You're, you know, and, yeah, and, but he's, he's, he's a, He's he's a very smart guy and he's very and listen, he's funny. He's really really funny, funny. so funny. very funny. Yeah. So and, remember when he brought? Remember when Frick brought him, bought him flowers that day? I mean, oh yeah, he's so funny oh because and him so and good Frick were, were 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 at each other for a while. The bromance, like it was so <laughs> fun. But like with, to get Frick to go buy flowers for him, I thought was just like that was genius. That was just <laughs> yeah. so. I mean, that, he broke him. Eric broke him. It was great. <laughs> I just worked with Frick a few years ago on something and you know, anybody that gets that guy is, is so lucky to have him too. Cause he's such a, a grounded, thoughtful, very deliberately paced supervisor. And he runs a team really well. And, you know, Frick is, Frick is, he's like, he, he's like, he always was, he's just a great guy, you know? And yeah. um, he's a lot more like than he used to be, but he, right. that's, you know, I like both flavors of Frick. They were, they were both delicious. <laughs> he's, uh, but he's great. I, I, he's another guy on my list of people I should check in with. It's just been too long. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've just been so busy um, making new friends that I don't want to forget about my old friends. You know. Yep. So I'm really glad you called me about this because this was. See, I was that's so the cool thing about this. this podcast is I can just keep doing that, and I'll just, ah, you know, I haven't I talked to it. Lou in a while. Let's have him on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm really grateful for it, man. It's uh, yeah, it's a really good excuse, you know. And I've, I'm coming up on 300 episodes, so I've done a lot of this. Shit. You were on what 19? You say 13. 13. Wow. I only remember because that was that's my birthday's on the 13th, so I remember. Wow. 13. So, so yeah, like, and that's been a lucky number for me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
That's cool. So, yeah. That's cool. It's cool. It's really great. Um, thanks so much for this, Chris. And you know, anything, anything else comes up, let me know, bud. I will you know? for sure. For I'll sure. try to get you some links for some behind the scenes stuff. If I can, I'll yeah. see what effects will allow for the last few years worth of work. And I'll yeah. see what searchlight will allow for Lucy. Cause you know, the, the, those tiles and Lucy, man, that was Mark, Mark Stetson had a nightmare about it because he was trying to help me solve it. And the DP came over to Zoic and she sat with me for like two or three days. We were trying to figure some stuff out and Stetson was trying popping in and out, trying to help us out. And Mark is like a legend, you know, yeah. he came in one day and he's like, I had this nightmare last night. He goes, it's been a long time since a problem on a VFX challenge has given me a nightmare, but it gave me a nightmare. Wow. You know ab about it. He dreamt about some giant camera that, um, Ari had built for us and we couldn't get the lens on it. Cause it was like a 400 pound lens. And he had this nightmare wow. about it. And I was like, man, I felt, I told Noah about that. And he, he was so happy. He's like, we're breaking brains. That's yeah. what he said. He's like, we're breaking <laughs> brains. That, that's what we want. Speaking of Mark, if you get in touch with him, let him know that I've been trying to get him on the podcast, but I think I lost his contact information or something. And I've been trying to get I'll, in touch with him. I'll, I'll get in touch with him. I will get in touch with him for you. And Cause I would love has to he have been him on, on one before. Mm -mm. He hasn't, Mark is, but I've had, Mark I've had Doug awesome. Trumbull on. <laughs> Doug Trumbull, my God, dude. I yeah. met Richard Donner at a party and he was like, oh, VFX guy. I knew a VFX guy once. Dougie, Dougie something, Dougie. Uh, what the hell, the <laughs> yeah. hell was his name? Uh, I was like, are you talking about Doug Trumbull? That was it. Trumbull, whiz kid, real smart guy. Anyway, nice to meet you, son. Walks off. I was like, <laughs> yeah, that was Richard Donner. Yeah. You know, because I was yeah. working for his wife. She's incredible. She's yeah. incredible. Lauren Donner. You should listen oh to God. that episode. It's, it's an amazing episode with Doug. I will. I got to go look through all your episodes, man. I didn't. Yeah. I've only heard a couple. Yeah. I got to go. Re I didn't but I would know love to have Mark on because I think Mark would be so, so cool. And he's such a nice, humble person too. Uh, yeah. Every time I talk to him, very sweet, very, you know. Yeah. Mark so. is great. He was my first uh, proper VFX suit at, at DD, um, you know, cause I did a commercial oh, really? yeah, Les that's right. who less is, less is a proper VFX suit. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. it was a short lived, very small part of a very short lived commercial that I came in late on. So my first proper like VFX soup at, at digital domain was Stetson on supernova. Right. So I was like blown away working with the blade runner guy. Are you kidding me? And all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, he's a, uh, he's a legend. So I'll, I'll get in touch with him and, and see, have you had Heineck on? No, I haven't had time. Uh, yeah. I'd love to have Heineck Joel. On. Yeah. God, Joel would be great. I saw him. When I was in Atlanta shooting Spider-Man Homecoming, I went out with him for a pretty wild night. Really? A pretty wild night that night. Yeah. I, nice. I got in a little bit of trouble that night, but uh, it was Joel. Okay. You know, when you're going out with Joel, baby, you never know what to expect. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. I really appreciate right, it. Thank we'll, you. We'll get really in touch. Great talking Keep, to you. Let me know what's going on. You know, don't be afraid to just reach out and email me if you want to. Totally. You want to hang out? Let's say, hey, let's let's have a Zoom drink together. And then I'm cool with that too. Dude, I'm all about the Zoom happy hours. The 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 V bar. Yeah, <laughs> the you know, V bar. The v bar is what I've been calling it, like a lowercase <laughs> V and uppercase B. The V bar. That's what my buddies and I've been calling it. So like, if you and Thrawn and those guys are hanging, I'm I'm down. If you need a guest, if okay. not, I don't want to invite myself. But no. I'm ha down for a happy hour. Here's the I'm rules. Here's the rules for Martin John because I've we have had guests on. We've had uh, what is uh, it? X Ray has been on. A couple other people. X Ray. Been. Yeah. Yeah. Fix has been uh, on. I could go on. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Martini Giant is usually a movie or a pair of movies or some kind of theme that we talk about. The podcasts go for three hours. Usually. <laughs> I could so talk you're... for three hours. Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. Uh, and then, uh, we, uh, we try to find an interesting pairing that goes along with it. And, uh, lately it's been, we've been taking turns, Eric, Dan and I coming up preparing. So like today I have to post a podcast and it was my choice. And the pairing I decided was, uh, Jean-Louis Godard's Masculin Feminin and, uh, John Waters Hairspray. <laughs> wow. Okay. And it's, uh, and it is a true, uh, it is truly about sort of, uh, revolutionary kids and Black Lives Matter and, uh. It's uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> wow. So you watch them in advance and then talk about them? Or then we talk play about them. them. And yeah. You walk, watch and some, them in advance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or we've already seen them or whatever. Times. So we always have those, these different pairings that we've done. So and if you, you come on and you, and you come on and say, okay, I want to be on and I want to talk about a certain uh, movie. Like Sally Slade, she was on our show and uh, oh, she wanted- My girl. 
she wanted to talk about uh, existence, and I was like, "All right, let's talk about Cronenberg. You know, let's do that." Yeah. Uh, so, so, so those are so do, you come in. He's like, "Okay, I, uh, if you want to be on, absolutely. You tell us what you want to talk about, and then uh, we'll right. have you on." Perfect. I'll I'll, I'll think of a pairing because yeah, like I have some ideas. Yeah, I have some I'm sure ideas. you do. I'm sure you do. Yeah. And weird is good. You know, like I said, X Ray did did Zardoz. That was a pretty hilarious. Uh, that was a fucking. Yeah, Sean Connery running around a loincloth, dude. That is. It's a better movie than you think it is, though. No, it is. I remember it. I mean, it's it's a lot of the haves and have nots, and the burden of the haves yeah. to have to deal with and take care of the have nots, and his yeah. solution to get them to kill themselves. I mean, that's it's happening around us. It's, <laughs> yes. you know, it's yeah. John Borman genius. I mean, <laughs> the guns are good. The penis is bad. Get them to stop reproducing. Get them to kill each other. I mean, like. I could have, I could have done that episode with you guys and the jewelry box at the end where you're basically literally yep. looking at the reflection of your own self and your own doing infinitely. Right. You're infinitely connected to what you're doing. Yep. I mean, the, the, the metaphor is in that deliverance is a better movie than people remember. People think I'll oh, squeal like a pig, but you watch deliverance and you're no, like, no, no, it's, yeah, they could, yeah. it's way a, more they could never that. make a movie like that again, ever. They could mm -hmm. never make a movie like that ever again. I mean, the liability of insurance of having your actors actually take on a class five fucking river. You'd never do it. You'd never right. do it. They'd never underwrite a movie like that again. And some of the weird, like mixed conservationist statements, like there's a moment in that movie and I watched it on a plane of all things with a guy you might know, a CG soup from Sony, a uh, gray haired guy named Chris, really cool guy. I, I have to remember his last name, um, okay. but he happened to be sitting behind me on the plane and I didn't know it at the time we met later. And he's like, you were on the plane. I think you were watching fucking deliverance, bro. That's a weird <laughs> choice for the plane. Um, but there's a moment where, you know, they're talking about flooding out that Valley and part of it is like, okay, they're going to flood out this Valley to build a reservoir. And that's an ecological disaster according to the hippies. Right. But right. Th they kind of come full circle at the end where it's like, no, sometimes progress means getting rid of some of this shit. You're going to wash out a lot of problems when you wash this, when you fill this place with water too. It's not just, yeah. it's not just bad. You know, I, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. And there's a moment where they're, they're out, they're done. They made it. They're in that guy's truck, but they're stuck behind. Cause all the town, all the, the important buildings have to leave town and they're moving buildings on those giant trailers. And they have yeah. the church on that one giant truck and the bells ringing like crazy ding 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 and they're stuck and the guy says the most amazing line in the movie he's driving he's driving real slow behind it and you're just your heart's pounding you're sweating bullets because those guys could run up to that truck and get them still and he's just like he's got to wait for the church to get out of the way <laughs> ah! <clears throat> and people think it's a movie about a retarded kid with a banjo or a guy getting banged up the ass it's 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 not. It's so much more than that. I mean, it's those things too, but yep. it's it's so much more than that. I mean, that line, just waiting for the church to get out of the way. Oh, bro. You know? And he made that around the time he made Zardoz too, right? I mean, that was, you know, Zardoz yeah. was a little earlier. Yeah. He, he made some Excalibur interesting too. movies. Excalibur, <laughs> Emerald Forest, right? Yeah. Point Blank. Point Blank's yep. one of my favorite movies. It's so good. He, but look at what a different bunch of different movies. Recently, I saw... Um, Friedkin, because I went to a 40th anniversary screening of The Exorcist with Friedkin and Ellen Burstyn doing Q&A afterwards. Right. And Friedkin, all right, Friedkin's definitely yeah. a big swinging dick. I mean, he's a big ego, right? <laughs> right? But he's fascinating. And he talked a lot about Sorcerer, which I'd never seen. Uh -huh, Have you seen uh -huh. Sorcerer? No. Incredible movie. Ask Thrawn about Sorcerer when you talk to okay. him next. I'm sure he has a dissertation on it. It is an incredible <laughs> film that could never be made now for many reasons. Well, think about but that. My, think about that as a as one of your one of your films or, or the film you I, want to talk. If you want to do one film, I'm, you want to do, I'm thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. My my predilection is always to go to the thing because that's my like favorite movie. The thing right. and Goodfellas and Lebowski are my favorite movies ever. But some but of I think if you find something make, that people haven't necessarily well, what's our tagline? Our tagline is uh, we talk about movies you've never seen and now you don't have to. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. I like that. That's pretty good. And you're drinking the whole time, so you get more drunk and honest as you go, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thrawn stopped drinking, so he doesn't drink anymore. <laughs> oh, really? Interesting. I, you know, I haven't had a drop since I've been back from Chicago. That's huh. only two weeks, but still, I mean, in Chicago, I was drinking every night. A glass of wine with dinner when I'm cooking. Yeah. I might break that seal tonight, though. I don't know. I keep saying that, and I keep going, nah, I'm kind of on a good run here. I'm going to just chill. Huh? 
Sounds good. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know, but uh, you know, any day when I do pick up a glass of wine, it's you know it's how not like we, I fell off a wagon or anything. I never was. You know in how a wagon. we got I that just, name, Martini Giant, uh, and what happened was that Thrawn and I would sneak over to the firehouse, you know, uh, and have a cocktail at the firehouse, and we would have a martini there. And because of Thrawn's stature, some of the other regulars, non-DD regulars at the firehouse, nicknamed him the Martini Giant because. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> and we amazing. The, the waitress told us about it, and then uh, my friend Daniel Buck. I don't know if you remember Daniel. I know Buck. Buck. Are you kidding? Of Love course. Buck. And he he he's like, oh my god! And right then he registered the domain. So we've been sitting on that domain for years, and then suddenly it's like, hey, we're gonna start a martini, uh, like a podcast about movies. He goes, well, let's just use Martini Giants. <laughs> That's how it's happened. done. Yeah, Martini Giant is amazing. That is just like. <laughs> The, the word martini is delicate and tiny and dry. And it's just so, <laughs> such a beautiful juxtaposition of visuals. It's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Well, make sure yeah. you send him my love and, and, and we'll Sheely as well. Those guys are, and that sounds like a lot of fun to talk to the three of you about movies. Oh, I know. I know. And we talk often, which is great. So it's been kind of nice to have that little partnership and stuff. So I love that. I yeah. love that. Definitely count me in when you guys do it again. All right. And then go check it well, out. That's another know. thing you can check out, martinigiant.com. You can see all our stuff. I'll go check there. it out. I'll check it out <laughs> later. I'm going to Ryan Wilkes' house now. And I think Wilk came to DD after you were gone. I'm going to go sit in his backyard, socially distant, and drink coconut water. But Nice. Well, uh, yeah. That sounds good. good. All right. All right have a good right, one, brother. buddy. You too, man. Thanks again. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>